that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to easily use 3D tracking data to accurately place flares in a scene, or direct your flare with a parallel light or spotlight cone angle. You can also now control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, Combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great for those classic 1970s and 80s movie looks. And in what is sure to be a favorite, schmutz can now be illuminated by the background, or your flare, or both. To help you work more efficiently in Real Lens Flares, we've also added a draft mode. Simply enable draft mode on your After Effects layer, and the render quality will be reduced by a factor of 4 to increase performance. When you go to render, draft mode is automatically ignored, and your flare is rendered at full quality. And remember that real lens flares and many of these new features are also now available in Adobe Premiere Pro. Universe has hundreds of presets to help you get started, and this release adds over 50 new presets to inspire your creativity and give your designs and edits a head start. Magic Bullet Looks also adds dozens of new presets to give you even more options for professional creative color grades. Also, the OCIO configuration in your After Effects project is now seen and synchronized with Magic Bullet Looks, so you don't have to worry about getting consistent color throughout your pipeline. Trapcode Particular has hot new features, introducing Combustion, a new fluid dynamics option to create fiery looks with particular particles. Control attributes like temperature over life as particles ignite and then turn to smoke. If you've ever created particle trails from a parent and had to increase the particle account significantly in order to create a line, now with the new stroke from parent feature, those lines are created for you automatically. Create particle trails and tails fast and easy and at perfect quality while still having control over essential attributes such as size, color, and opacity over life. All through this year, we've been regularly releasing new sets of capsules. Maxon's collection of tailor-made materials, models, and nodal assets to help you kickstart your projects, including plant assets by Laubwerk, home decor models by Pavel Zoch, and redshift materials by Fuchs and Vogel that are perfect for architectural visualization, product shots, and motion graphics. There's also a new brake spline modifier by Rocket Lasso, which allows you to evenly or randomly subdivide splines with spacing, great for creating dynamic stacks with objects swept along curves. And speaking of regular releases, at Maxon, we're continually striving to not only bring value to artists, but also to add features that will inspire you to create your best work. And in case you missed it, we released many other incredible features this summer. Redshift added a jitter node to create color variations across multiple objects that use the same material, as well as a matte cap shader node to render non-photoreal surfaces. Particular added several new gradient interpolation models to create more pleasing blends of colors. It also added more control over what child systems can inherit, as well as a built-in ground plane for bouncing particles. And of course, we added a huge new collection of presets that show off the power of all these new features. And last but not least, our mobile sculpting app Forger got a ton of great new features, including sweep, lathe, area lights, multiple cameras and orthographic views, knolls and object hierarchy, and the sketch tool, which allows you to create 3D geometry by simply sketching with your finger or an Apple pencil. At Maxon, we're committed to regularly providing fresh content, additional resources, and important features for the tools you rely on every day. And we're continuing to do this with our fourth major update to Maxon One this year. We continue to be amazed and inspired about how our community uses our tools and what they create with them. So join us virtually or in person at IBC in Amsterdam in September, 
where we'll feature a range of compelling presentations from a diverse group of talented artists and studios sharing their creative processes and creations. And don't forget that you can interact with us every day on live webinars and shows. And you can learn more about the tools from our vast library of helpful tutorials at Cineversity on the Maxon site. To find out more about the complete set of powerful 3D and post-production tools in Maxon One, visit us at maxon.net.
At Maxon, we're dedicated to helping you bring your creative concepts to life. Whether it's giving shape to characters through ZBrush, sculpting seamlessly with Forger, breathing life into animations and dynamic motion designs using Cinema 4D, achieving photorealistic renders via Redshift, enhancing visuals with the prowess of Red Giant tools, or infusing videos with unique stylized aesthetics through Uverse, we've got you covered. Our latest release of Maxon One focuses on providing power at the speed of creativity. We recognize Maxon tools are where you feel you're most creative, so we've prioritized performance, so your creative spark is constantly fueled. Our tools are faster than ever, with performance gains in Cinema 4D, Redshift, and Red Giant. Of course, we've also added some great new capabilities to your creative quiver as well. Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the note editor, even better Redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, cloth, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh. Or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new note editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, new nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The view Good morning, everyone, and good morning to everyone watching live. It's the last day of IBC, and we have some amazing artists and Maxon trainers coming on board. Uh, in the morning, we have Maximus Raharjo, who is a resident colorist and as well as a Maxon trainer. He is an award winner, but he says his show is the award winner, which I do not agree to. Max is a color award winner. He has his show, Max on Color, which is live on U Max on YouTube channel in the coming week, right? Yeah. Max on Training Team YouTube channel. And please tune into it. It's amazing. You have a chance to win an award as well if you scan the QR code, which shows up after the presentation. So, Max, all yours. Thank you very much, Karan. Thank you for such a nice introduction. And... Um, Thank you very much, everybody who's joining me today. I hope you enjoy the show so far. Sadly, um, every good thing's coming to an end, isn't it? So it's the last time, last day of IBC. 
let's just enjoy the remaining of IBC. And um, yeah, uh, my name is Max, as Karan already introduced me. And I am a trainer and resident colorist at Maxon. And at Maxon, I run a show called Max on Color. Well, <laughs> surprise, surprise. And um, yeah, and today um, we're going to talk a little bit about color grading. So I've, if you have been creating content in the last couple of years, you probably, you know, stumble upon the term or the discipline of color grading, aren't you? So um, it's a process to, you know, master your image to make a perfect and beautiful imagery from your projects, right? Um, sometimes, though, when you are starting color grading, things can be like very complicated and very misleading. And um, I remember my journey when back in the day starting in color grading. I feel like, what should I do? There are so many buttons. Which buttons should I push? And what is the correct uh, way to do that? And um, yeah, today we're just going to talk about that. But if we are going to the title of the presentations, the presentations today will be just about creating a versatile look or crafting looks versatile. I'm sorry. Bad joke. Um, why though? Why creating versatile looks? Why is it important? Um, I hope we're going to talk about that. We're going to explore about that uh, further later down the road, right? So if you ever do color grading, let me just make it full screen. If you ever do color grading, you, I mean, I remember my um, story when I, I'm sorry, it's, it's like a share because, you know, sharing is caring. I remember my journey when I am um, starting out as a colorist back in the day. So I feel that I really don't know what I'm doing, but I have all this button. Maybe I can just like eyeing it out and ball it until I got it. Right? So those are like the pretty much um, the old approach that I used to do. I see like there's one clip, color correct it, color grade it, make it until it looks good, apply a look, move to another clip, and do it exactly the same thing over and over again. Copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste. It could be great because you got to spend the most of your time in one clip and make them look beautiful. But what if you have 15 minutes clips? Do you want to spend the whole weeks to do that? Well, let me show you in, in, in practice how that approach may look like, right? So here, I have a timeline, a really short timeline, just about somebody playing bowling, all right? So, in the old days, when I'm starting uh, grading, what I would do is normally I'll pick a hero image. It's normally a wide angle image where I can see my environment, I can see my uh, subject, and then I start eyeing it out. So back in the day when I want to start it, at that probably, okay, I know that this is log image, log image is very flat and desaturated, so probably I need to add contrast and add saturations and make them look beautiful. So probably what I'm going to do is that add contrast a little bit, perhaps play around with the gamma and add the saturations, and perhaps after that create another note and, okay, I want to make it look beautiful. Maybe add a look on top of it. Let's add magic bullet looks. Because I have magic bullet looks, it definitely can make things look beautiful. So I know that this is a footage that's coming from Ari Alexa. More about that later. Same as input. So I'll just create some looks. And if that would be like, OK, acceptable, I will move to another clip and repeat the same process. But that would be like very demanding if you have like at least just 15 minutes clips because it takes so much time out of your um, time. Um, the, other, the other way to do that back then is through the utilizations of LUT or lookup table, right? So if I just reset everything, another way to do that is that 
I'm using the lookup table that coming from the camera manufacturers, which is like scientifically accurate because it is according to their image science. So what I'm going to do is that, all right, perhaps I will just apply a lookup table. And this is a lookup table that coming from Ari uh, that transform from Ari Loxy to, uh, to Rec 709, right? And then after that, instead of working after the LUT, I need to work prior to the LUT. So why is that? Why is that? Bear in mind, we are still in the old approach. So just imagine if you are going to create anything, to adjust anything after the LUT. And then after that, like for example here, I reduce my exposure after the LUT and then bring up my exposure again. You'll see that I have a clipping in the waveform, if you see that. And those are the things that I won't be able to rescue. But for example, if the same approach, the same adjustment done prior to the LUT, look at that. How different is that? So probably what I'm going to do is that from now on, I will apply the LUT. I will adjust the contrast, adjust the saturations, create the look, and go to another clip and repeat that again. That's boring. You, you got to spend your time in this most technical part where you can just actually focus on the very fun part, creating the looks itself. Right. So back to my presentations. Right. Um, what if we change our um, way of thinking a little bit and think of a new approach, a newer and better approach? What if there is a newer and better approach that we can use to just perhaps create looks for the whole timeline and then after that just play, uh, just do a balance within clip level only for the clips to make them um, cohesive. So the benefit of this approach is that you will have a cohesive look because you are developing a look that is applied to the entire clip on the timeline and then you just do color grading under it to make it work, right? So, and if you have different scenes, you can just go per scenes and tweak it to make it sync with the scenes, right? So, but bear with, me, bear with me though. Hang on, water break. This approach has its own kinks. It has its own um, demands. I think if you want to use this approach, um, you need to at least understand just a slightly, just a little bit of color science. And um, it's not that you need to understand the full-blown of color science. There are a minimum requirement, so to say, and just understand a practical color science, right? And if you don't want to, you can always just hang out with people who knows color science, and you know they will tell you what to do, right? Outsource. And um, the the journey of understanding uh, practical color science can be started by having a good understanding of color space. So what is a color space? There's a huge question among the, the uh, creative people out there, right? So color space in its simple uh, definitions is a specific, measurable, and fixed set of range of colors and luminance values that can be accurately um, represented in, a, in any digital or um, analog system. So bear, bear with me that I mentioned two different uh, stuff there, a specific range of colors and luminance value. It kind of reveals the secret ingredients of color space itself. And color space is actually consists of color gamut and tone curve. So any color space must have color gamut and tone curve. So color gamut refers to the uh, colors that a specific color space uh, can represent. It, it gives you, it defines the boundaries of color and help us to visualize what is possible and what is the limitations within a given space. And tone curve is 
quite the opposite. It is the representations of how brightness values are distributed on that particular color space, and it plays an important role in shaping the overall um, contrast of our images and the tonality of our images, right? But there could be like plenty of like different color space out there. And is there a way to, for you to categorize them to make it easier? And yes, if you are interested to, um, to color grading, at least you just need to understand these three different stuff, different color space. Your camera or your output or your uh, source color space, your intermediate or your working color space, and your output color space. The camera color space or the source color space is the color space where your image was shot in or where your render were, was rendered in. And your display color space is like the final color space where your um, image is going to be viewed. This could be your computer screen, this could be your phone screen, this could be a TV, cinema, anything, or this projector. And the working color space is that your specific uh, choice or the intermediate color space where you want to do your adjustment. And um, that's the minimum requirement of this new approach when you want to create a look that uh, can be applied onto um, many different uh, variety of projects. So let me show you the hands-on approach on that. Okay, same timeline, right? So what's nice with uh, DaVinci Resolve is that uh, by default, let me go back into my presentations again. Uh, by default, if you have a timeline and if you do, don't do any groupings, and if you see somewhere over there, you only have two dots, and that is only representing the clip level and the timeline level. So anytime you do any adjustment in your timeline, it will, up, up, it will be applied onto the whole clips in your timeline, right? As you can see here, I added red in my timeline, and it will be applied to the whole timeline. And the clip level, if I just apply anything in the clip level, it will be just be applied onto that clip. So if you group your clips accordingly, and this, this can be done by grouping per camera source or grouping per whatever you want, but my personal choice is to group it via scenes. Because you know, if you group it per scenes, you can target all different clips that is um, uh, that belongs to same scene. So again, you are working to create a cohesive looks. So um, when you are grouping them, you have two extra groups, the group pre-clip and the group post-clip. So the group pre-clip and post-clip, anytime you do any adjustment on that uh, category, um, the adjustment will be um, carried out, will be, will be um, how do you call it? We'll take an effects onto the clips that belong to the same groups only. So now let's play around a little bit with the new approach. So before we uh, jump, or, uh, jump into creating the looks, like I said before, we just need um, um, to know a, a bare minimum understanding of color science. And what I'm going to do is that I want to transform my image into the same universal uh, working space. So I know at the moment it kind of like, mm, this, that doesn't make any sense because everything is coming from the same camera. This is Ari Loxy. Why would you? Well, I would argue that I like, um, if, you, if you ever like um, familiar, familiarize yourself with one specific color space, your tools will behave in certain ways. And if you familiar, you're, uh, familiarize yourself with that color space, you kind of like building a muscle memory, and you know your contrast adjustment, you know this and that. Repeatability, repeatability that's, that's the word. Oh my God. That's the important thing, right? So in this case, my color space of choice to tackle my adjustment is in ACES. So what I'm gonna do is that in the group preclip, I will apply the 
plugins that is called ACES Transform. So in here, if I enable it, I will select, I will, I will, I will inform the framework that I will inform the plugin that this is an image coming from Ari Loxi, uh, Ari White Gamut, Ari Loxi Color Space and Tone Curve. And I want to transform it into ACES AP1 with ACES CCT Tone Curve. So that's what I did. And it changed from this image into even more flatter image. It's like, Max, are you crazy? What are you doing? But bear with me. Because on the timeline level, on the timeline level, what I'm going to do is that I, quite, I did the opposite. So I am applying the same plugins, but instead of, from, uh, instead of going from Ariloxy to our Asicicity, I'm going from Asicicity, my intermediate, my working color space, into my display color space, my target color space. And in this case, I want to target Rec 709. So that's my choice over there, Rec 709. And simply just by doing that, I can normalize the whole entire image in my timeline easily, right? Except for this one, because it belongs to different group. So I haven't enabled the input transform. There you go. Now we're up into a very good starting point. So let me choose my hero image again, and let us create a look that we can, that we can um, apply onto this um, project. So in creating the looks, um, using Magic Bullet Looks. And Magic Bullet Looks is a plugin from Red Giant that helps you to simplify the, creation, the process of looks creations. Um, let me launch Magic Bullet Looks. What's nice with Magic Bullet Looks is that um, it is available in many different host apps. So you can use it in DaVinci Resolve, you can use it in Premiere Pro, you can use it in Final Cut Pro, you can use it everywhere, even in Cinema 4D and in Unreal Engine. So once you get to know Magic Bullet Looks in one application, you can repeat it anywhere else, right? So just to walk you, walk, through a little, walk you through a little bit about Magic Bullet, it's very simple. Um, right at the bottom, you have the Looks drawer. And if you press L, it will open and close the Looks drawer, the preset drawer. And by the way, there are plenty of presets that uh, shipped with Magic Bullet Looks. I think it's over 300. And recently, we just released a new presets. So there are 38 new presets that is based on film emulations. So if you like to do film emulations, if you like to start um, your grade with film emulations, there is a very good film emulations presets. And if you just want to get a quick fix and a, uh, want to have a specific looks that emulate the look of a blockbuster movies, you can go to silver screen. Those are the, the new presets. I, I think you probably know already if, I'm, if you're reading Dream House, what probably the movie is, or Euphoric, or May the 4th, you know, right? And uh, the, the other new presets are based on music videos. So we have six new presets on music videos. And the last but not least is the utility that is to soften your highlights and to create a vintage detuned lenses uh, looks, right? So that's uh, a little bit about the presets. And um, after the presets, you also have scopes. So for example, if we press S, you'll be opening and closing the scopes. And there are plenty of different scopes. There are six of them. And if I going to drag the boundaries between my viewport and the scopes, you can really see that the scope is interactively scaled up and down, right? And we have the control panels, C, to open and close it. So once you uh, select a specific tools and you press C, and you'll see that there is the uh, control panels. And the tools panels, and the shortcut for that is T for tools. 
So there are plenty of tools in the Magic Bullet looks. The first one is the selective tools, which is like the tools that you can emulate um, the look of any adjustment that you do on the set. Maybe if you are putting a negative fill onto your um, subject, you can try to emulate that with the tools that are available in the selective tools. The camera tools, mostly like the camera technique and filters, the color correction tools, and the film emulation tools. Right, the two special tools that very near and dear to me heart is the optical diffusions and the halations. The optical diffusions and the halations is developed um, in, in, a, in a respect of a 3D uh, principle called um, energy conservations. So anytime you push um, these tools, the exposure change, the exposure levels will not change in your image. So you can go crazy and you know for sure that your exposure will remain intact. That is because these two tools is not generating its own lights. It is taking the available lights in the scenes and then recalculate it and give you back the diffusions or the halations. So the looks that I created here, all right, the heart of this looks is based on a film print emulations. And as you can see here, the film stocks that I choose is Kodak 2383, but I can also choose Fuji 3510. And as you see, I can go like crazy with it, with full power, but instead of doing that, I'll just use it very teeny tiny a little bit. I don't know how it looks in your screen. And after that, I apply a LUT, and this LUT is actually uh, the handcrafted LUT that I did in Resolve, and I bring it into uh, Magic, Bullet LUT, uh, Magic Bullet Looks LUT tool using this, um, using this icon over here. So you can always bring in your LUT into Magic Bullet Looks as well. And below that, before the LUT, um, there is a channel mixer tool to just change the shade of uh, the tint of blue and red that I have. And I have the halations and diffusions. And last but not least, right at the end, I have the renoiser tools. So what's nice about renoiser tools is that you can think of it as a parametric film grain. So let me just put renoiser tools and let us focus somewhere over there. So what the renoiser do is that it creates a virtual grain between your pixels. And based on the, on the um, parameter that you set here, it can, you can adjust how big the grain is, how dense it is. Uh, do you want to have more grains in the red channel or green channel or blue channel? Or do you want to have more grain in the highlight, midtone, or shadow? It's very flexible. But there are also plenty of presets. And that's Renoiser. And before Renoiser and after Renoiser. And as you can see, I just use a very um, small amount of Renoiser. So when we confirm Magic Bullet looks, now we have a look that is applied throughout our timeline, right? But as you can see, Max, that's not finished. It feels like too dark and too, uh, I don't know what's the word, edgy. Maybe you can bring the balance up a little bit. So that's actually um, reveal like the very important thought process here. That is, you know, creating one looks that works for the entire eclipse is just one part of the game. The other part is the color grading itself. Lux is not supposed to be a replacement for a color grading process, but it is a complementary process to your color grading, right? So it doesn't mean that after you create a Lux, you're done, out, finished. You still need to color grade your footage. And in this example, I will show you just a very simple uh, grading that I did using just the primary tools to, um, to make the footage looks way much better and uh, works with the looks that I created. 
So first thing first, what I did is just, I adjust the exposure using the HDR exposure tools because it's photometrically accurate. But bear in mind though, since it is a color um, space aware tools, to do that, to, to be able to make the most of your adjustment using the HDR tool in Resolve, you need to inform the tools what color space you're in and what is your tone curve. And you can do that by clicking these three dots over here. And in this case, the color space of my choice is ACES AP1. And the tone curve is the ACES CCT, right? So by doing that, I will be able to perform a photometrically, photometrically uh, correct exposure adjustment. So after adjusting the exposure, I adjust my contrast level a little bit. And that is just by doing um, a very simple contrast adjustment using the contrast and pivot button in the primary tools. And on top of that, I also add the gamma up a little bit, right? So I just bring the midtone of the image slightly up. And I adjust the saturations right at the end, right? And as you can see, the saturations itself, it, it, like, it is a big part of the adjustment. And that is actually um, not just a simple saturations boosted up. And if you can see, in these saturations, um, in this saturations um, node, what I did is that, as you can see, the saturations remain at 50. There's nothing changed. What I did is that I round trip to a different color space that has a separate saturation channel and just boost the saturations in that color space. So what, how to do that? Simple. So you can go uh, to that specific node, create, um, uh, select color space, and select HSV because HSV color, uh, color space stands for the hue, saturations, and value. Um, so you, you, can, uh, you can access just the saturation channel without affecting the two, the hues and the luminance, right? And, and as you can see, the channel that I have active is just the second channel. And in HSV, the second channel, guess what? It's the saturations, HSV. Right, and by increasing the gamma slider in the uh, primary toolbars, now I can target the saturations in the saturation channel because now lift, gamma, gain become the hue, saturations, and value. Easy. But you may argue, well, why don't you just use uh, saturations max and just max it out like that? I mean. It depends though, sometimes it can look great, but I just like to, to have these separations to just target the saturations in the saturations um, instead of like bringing the luma all together up by, re by increasing the saturation slider. So if you're increasing saturations in the RGB color space, it means that you're adjusting the saturations as well as the brightness of the image, right? So I don't want that, I just want the saturations. So let me delete this. And finally, last but not least, what I did is just balance out the image. And this is like very simple process. And what I did is just I'm playing around with the offset. So let me reset that. It feels like I can add a little bit more blue. And to do that, I, I will just focus on using the offset um, wheel, offset tools. And I'll just increase the blue slightly and I will reduce the red slightly, as that is too much, and just reduce the green slightly. That is a little bit much. So, before, after. And that's actually exactly the same thing that I repeat in the other scenes. Again. So, and again, right? So, and by doing that, by just grading under the look that I created on the timeline level, I can create something that is really cohesive throughout the entire project.
But what if I have like a different scene, Max? What if I want to make this outdoor scenes to look slightly different, right? Hang on. So if I enable the grade under it, what I can do is that I can go into the group level. So I can just target that particular clips in that specific scenes, and I can create a, sp a, a different um, tweaks to the looks that I created. So in this case, I am just using Magic Bullet Looks again. And if I launch Magic Bullet Looks, you can really see that I'm just using optical diffusions, halations, and color blend to fake the effect to make it as if it is a glow effects and color it red, right? And that's what I did. And as you can see, it's just 15% of the strength. So you don't have to use Magic Bullet Looks all the way, 100%, right? So before Magic Bullet Looks, after Magic Bullet Looks. And then after that, I tweaked it a little bit using just the offset control. Same deal like before. And now, if we run through all of this, we can be sure that pretty much we have a cohesive looks on our clips, on our project. Not just our clips, but for the entire clips in our projects. So far, is there any questions? Sounds good? I take it as a no? All right. Um, next thing, I would like to show you the, same, the very same approach um, how, how can you translate this approach when you are grading in Premiere Pro? Are you out of luck? Well, let's see. Let me close DaVinci Resolve. And we have Premiere Pro timeline, exactly the same timeline as before, right? Um, you probably already guess. Ah, he's using adjustment layer. But that's the, the secret. Just use adjustment layer and put magic bullet looks to affect the whole entire clips on your image. So let me enable the adjustment layer. Uh, let me enable Magic Bullet Looks. So what I did here in Magic Bullet Looks in the adjustment layer, perhaps let me pick the, the other frame. Right. So what is different here? Before, in Resolve, we are working within ACES framework. So we need to make sure that Magic Bullet Looks will need to be able to go from ACES and back out to ACES again. But now in Premiere Pro with the default project settings, what I'm going to do is that I'm using Magic Bullet Looks to go from ARRI to, to work in ACES. And the input will be from ARRI um, Alexa here, ARRI um, V3 Log C. Uh, with exposure index of 800, and the output will be Rec 709. So I'm working within ACES um, framework in Magic Bullet Looks, but I'm, I'm not um, spitting out ACES back in my way out. So I'm targeting my display space right at the end and exactly within Magic Bullet Looks. And it is exactly the same looks as before. So if I confirm that, I think we are on the same good starting point as before, right? And now, how do you grade that? Because you are not in ACES, and, and how do you fake this to, to make it happen? And what you can do is that you can go to the clip and then apply Colorista. And that's what I'm doing there. So, and in Colorista, instead of having col the response in f uh, on video, that's the basic response, basically, the default one. You need to change the response into lock because Colorista will take whatever the color space, um, the clip it is in, and then it will just do adjustment on that, and it will giving you out um, the, how do you call it, the, the result. And in this case, when we are working this way, we're not working inside the ACES framework. Our look is but our grade is done in the camera color space. So what I'm going to do is just the same thing like before. I can adjust the contrast slightly. Let me reset Colorista. 
Okay, what I'm gonna do is that set the control response from video to lock, reset. Change the control response from video to lock. And first thing first, play around with the contrast. That's a little bit too much. Just reduce the contrast slightly. And now what I'm gonna do is that bump up my exposure slightly. There you go. And last but not least, I can saturate my image, add saturations using this HSL wheel. So for example, if I don't want the red to be like very saturated, I can just drag this point to the middle and decrease the saturations of my red. But that's not the effect that I want. I want to make the brighter saturated image a little bit darker. And in order to do that, I will use the second wheel. And if I click this radio button over here, I'll have the detailed adjustment. So what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to dra drag the red lightness a little bit towards the center. And the blue as well. Something like that. And then I can play around with the saturation if I if I want. And if I want to, I can brighten up my shadow regions as well. So I'll lift my shadow slightly to make the image a little bit more airy so and before and after but bear, 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 um, remember that we have one looks that is applied to the entire timeline and that will make the cohesive looks for all your entire image so that's how you do it in Colorista. Of course, you need to copy and paste uh, Colorista in each and different clips and do exactly the same things again. And um, that was it. Is there any questions so far? If there's no questions, there's another tricks that I want to show you. Because we, have, we are coming to an end and I just want to show you another tips uh, whenever you want to develop a looks, right? Because normally when you develop a looks, um, you need to have some, some guidance, right? If, if, especially if you want to steal a looks. Um, I would say that instead of um, stealing the looks graphically, taking one image and compare it to another image and work it graphically, try to work on the, onto the photography itself. Right, because most of the looks coming from the photography, and there is such a nice tools inside uh, DaVinci Resolve that you can use to know pretty much like uh, how is the image was shot, how it was done, and how do they do it, and so on and so forth. Right, um, and the the tools is not very fancy. It's called false color, right, and you can still use false color. So if you're using false color into any um, still image that you uh, can get from any internet or, or a screenshot of your favorite movie, for example, this one is from Top Gun that I take from Shot Deck. If I just want to know how is the photography done, roughly, because I know that there is looks on top of that. But if I just want to know how is the photography done, I can still use false color on these images. And to do that, let me just enable this. Show compound node. To do that, I can use false color, obviously. But since we know that this is an image that is already in the display space, it's a Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4 images. Meanwhile, my color, uh, my false color, is requiring black magic um, 4.6K in film. Um, I can always transform my image. Right, so I can always use color space transform onto my Rec. 709 image, and then apply the correct input color space. In this case, it's uh, it's sRGB, and the input gamma is same as RGB, and then I transform it into black magic uh, white gamut Gen 4 or 5 with black magic design Gen 5 tone curve, and disable the tone mapping and disable the gamut mapping. And then just by enabling 
the false color, applying the false color, and change the camera model and the camera mode specifically to what you did in your color space transform, now you can really see that right. The 50% gray is right on spot on his shirt. And then the skin color, the skin tone, is one stop below the 50% gray. And then we have like the near black area on this tires area. And then we, ne we hardly clips any highlights because there is no red that you can see in your image, just this um, gray. And if I disable that, and you can kind of already see how the photography was done on the set, roughly. So that was it. I hope you learned something today. And if you have any questions, and if you want to uh, connect, um, you can always visit maxon.net slash events. Um, in training team, we run a lot of um, training program. And we have a plenty of events. And to check them out, you can go to maxon.net slash events. For example, next Thursday, um, there will be another session of Maxon Color. And next Monday, there will be another uh, Demystifying Post Productions. And if you're wondering, where can I see that? Is this event being recorded? Can I rewatch it after it goes live? Absolutely, you can. In this time and era, you can always go to YouTube, type in Maxon Training Team, and you will be able to watch all the recorded um, webinars. And what's nice is that those webinars will be timestamped by our beloved colleague, Dr. Sassy. Hi, if you watch it, I love you, man. And yeah, you can skip the boring part and jump into the point where you just want to um, get informed. So I think we come to the end of the presentations. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions about color grading, feel free to reach out to us. Um, my email is maxoncolor at maxon.net, or you can always write us at training at maxon.net as well. Thank you very much. Peace. Peace. Thank you so much, Max Thank on you, Color. Thank you, See what I did there? Max on Color. Yeah. yeah. Since now I'm off, then Max off, off. Color. Color. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Max. It's always you, amazing. I, by the way, I used to sit in the opposite office to Max, and we always chit chat about photography. He's into photography as well. Oh, Karan is yeah. a very I'm fantastic, not, uh, amazing not. film photographer, and um, I really blessed work with Karan and I I enjoyed his, his post in Instagram so much I really okay. am your biggest fan Karan. Thank you, thank you Max, I'm here to host you and not you hosting me but thank you um, thank you so much everyone um, please scan the QR code that you see to win prizes from Maxon, Wacom and Corvive, uh, you can check the schedule after this or you can go to the Maxon website and check the schedule um, also to learn more, as Max said, go to the Maxon website, go on the learn button, learn more. You can check the live stream on Maxon YouTube channel and restream it later in the day. Uh, we'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you again. Thank you, Karan.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the node editor, even better redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh. Or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamp the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new node editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, new nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. All through this year, we've been regularly releasing new sets of capsules. Maxon's collection of tailor-made materials, models, and nodal assets to help you kickstart your projects, including plant assets by Laubwerk, home decor models by Pavel Zoch, and registered materials by Fuchs and Vogel that are perfect for architectural visualization, product shots, and motion graphics. There's also a new break spline modifier by Rocket Lasso, which allows you to evenly or randomly subdivide splines with spacing, great for creating dynamic stacks of objects swept along curves. Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to easily use 3D tracking data to accurately place flares in a scene, or direct your flare with a parallel light or a spotlight cone angle. You can also now control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. 
Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great for those classic 1970s and 80s movie looks. And in what is sure to be a favorite, schmutz can now be illuminated by the background, or your flare, or both. To help you work more efficiently in Real Lens Flares, we've also added a draft mode. Simply enable draft mode on your After Effects layer, and the render quality will be reduced by a factor of 4 to increase performance. When you go to render, draft mode is automatically ignored, and your flare is rendered at full quality. And remember that Real Lens Flares and many of these new features are also now available in Adobe Premiere Pro. Universe has hundreds of presets to help you get started, and this release adds over 50 new presets to inspire your creativity and give your designs and edits a head start. Magic Bullet Looks also adds dozens of new presets to give you even more options for professional creative color grades. Also, the OCIO configuration in your After Effects project is now seen and synchronized with Magic Bullet Looks, so you don't have to worry about getting consistent color throughout your pipeline. Trapcode Particular has hot new features, introducing Combustion, a new fluid dynamics option to create fiery looks with particular particles. Control attributes like temperature over life as particles ignite and then turn to smoke. If you've ever created particle trails from a parent and had to increase the particle account significantly in order to create a line, now with the new stroke from parent feature, those lines are created for you automatically. Create particle trails and tails fast and easy and at perfect quality while still having control over essential attributes such as size, color, and opacity over life.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are now with Alexandru, who is going to talk about Maxon Red Giant, and he's an award-winning compositor as well. We are blessed to be working with award winners. Mm. That is amazing. Um, he is also a product manager for Maxon Red Giant, and he's going to talk about quick, quick effects with Red Giant, right? Exactly. Amazing. Exactly. All yours. Thank you. Everybody loves to set me up. Just so I'm ready to disappoint. Uh, so thank you, Karan, for all the compliments. Um, thank you all for being here. IBC, at least for me, has been amazing. I think the best part of such an event is getting to connect with the community, getting to know each other, exchange, inspire, and uh, for me, has been quite the experience. So thank you all for being here. Today, I'm going to present how to use universe in uh, unexpected ways. And I think everybody that works in an NLE, it's, it's understands how much you need sometimes a background or a fast text and so on. And universe is great for that. Universe is built to give you all the tools necessary to have transitions, blurs, glows, text, logo motion, motion graphics, and so on. It's, it's the perfect package for video editors. And I'm also going to showcase how to use Red Giant and kind of showcase how our products are extremely playful and versatile and can be used in so many hosts. Uh, I prepared a little showcase here, and I'm just going to play it, just kind of like showcase exactly what you can achieve. So... For everyone that was two days ago here, we already went through how you can create with Red Giant a title sequence, so that was part of the showcase. Uh, today I'm going to go through the project files and kind of like do a semi breakdown of how we can achieve some, some of those effects and create a fast video background and kind of like quickly put something together. Sometimes you don't have a lot of time and you just need something quickly, right? And uh, that's what I'm going to go through today. And uh, the showcase that I just showed was actually put together in a day. Like everything was made super quick and that's the idea of it. It's being very playful and embracing that playfulness of just combining things and all of a sudden you have something that may be interesting enough for you to use. So the first project file that I have uh, it's basically using um, real life footage and um, remove the green screen of my subject and so on and then combine it with universe to create um, to create some sort of a presentation and so on. Um, now, what I like about the Red Giant tools, if I open here, oops, well, that was unexpected. Let me just quickly restart. Talking about combining in unexpected ways. <laughs> so, there you go. We're back online here. Perfect. So, let me just open my footage real quick and kind of like solo things here. So, what I like about the Red Giant tools is that they're very interactive and they allow me to create very fast without having to understand the technical depths and how things work. So, if I were to showcase here Primate here, which is perfect to remove any green screen from your footage, if I were to introduce back some, let's say, some of my greens, then I can just click on the tool and simply draw, and all of a sudden my green is are back from the green screen. And if I want to remove it, I just switch the brush and with one simple click, drag and drop, and my my footage, my green screen is it's getting removed all of a sudden. Let me just put everything back the way it was. Um, in this project, exactly uh, after I remove the the green screen that I needed. I set up some sort of like windows and universe hot elements. It's perfect for that. Um, 
let me just create real quick a solid just to kind of showcase you how fast it is to create those hard elements. I'll name it hard elements. I'm going to solo it. Search for hard elements. And this tool, it is perfect if you want to put together hard super quick, if you want to create GUI, FUI, if you want to create user interface. And um, in this case here, I just went down to element, and I choose to use the capsules that we provide with hard elements, which there are so many options and so many ways you can combine. And scrolling down, you come across the variety of windows we provide. And it's just one click apply, and all of a sudden I have my window. Um, and after that, I just pretty much remove the glow because I'm going to do that afterwards, so I don't need the glow for now. And I just like disable it and change the color from blue to white. And afterwards, I just added a bunch more elements. Um, it's able to handle more than one element within one solid. So if I were to add another window for now, let's say this one, now I have another window. And as I was mentioning, it is extremely interactive and super easy to just like play around and position your elements and uh, customize them uh, the way you want. And that's how I was able to achieve this and put together all of those windows and create something interesting. Um, afterwards, I played um, a little bit with text because I, I was just looking to kind of like present um, Maxon Universe. Um, and typographic is perfect for that. And because we have so many capsules, it is extremely easy to get it started. Um, I like to work with the Universe dashboard open at all times because it speeds up my workflow. That's why I have it always active. And um, if you were to click on Choose Presets, you can see how, how much variety we provide and how many options you have. Um, you can literally start with anything and pretty much make it your own. If I were to create another solid here, just to showcase, let's name it text. I'm going to solo it for now and apply this, this, uh, this capsule here. It's already applied, already animated, super easy, super quick. From there, it's just a matter of making it my own. So I can just change the text, hello. IBC, and that's it. In a couple of seconds, I have something that I can work with. I don't need to, I don't need to learn. I don't need to stress myself. I don't need to do a lot. And that's what I love about the the Regine tools. It's just it allows me to direct my art rather than creating from scratch. And the capsules just kind of like amplifies that, and um, that's perfect uh, for my needs. Uh, so. Um, after I created the windows, I got my text ready, I choose the colors I like, and so on. It's just about adding a, a little extra detail to make it a bit more interesting. And um, for that, I needed a faster background. And the way I was able to achieve that is by using gradient ramp. Um, I am a fan of gradients. I love to work with gradients. And I'm also a fan of oversaturated colors. And my colors clip all the time. but to be fair, I don't always pay attention to that, because what I care about is to be fast and to look good. And with gradient ramp, you can easily put together um, a background. And then, as I was mentioning previously, because our tools are so versatile and they play very well together, uh, you can combine it with texturized motion. And all of a sudden, you have like a background ready for, for your composition. So if I were to play here. It's, it's done. It's exactly what I'm looking for. And texturized motion is perfect because it's, it's animating your textures, and it's able to take even your custom textures. So if you have something that you like, um, maybe you're not, um, you're, not, you're not exactly sure to you if you want to use the variety that we bring. Maybe you have something that you want to use. Uh, it's able to even input your custom textures and animate it for you. So I don't even have to deal with keyframes anymore. I just use texturized motion, 
input my texture, and it's just a matter of playing with the looks and how I like to how, how would I like it to 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 look. Uh, so that's how I was able to create to achieve that background there, and then at the end, it's just about blending them together, blending all of those elements together. And for me personally, I'm not a colorist, and uh, I'm so happy that Max was previously to me, kind of like showcasing to you, you know, color science, color grading, how everything works, and he's perfect for that. Um, but I'm not a colorist, and I don't have a lot of time to kind of like learn every single craft. That's why I respect everybody, because, you know, their craft is truly amazing, and dedicating, de dedicating so much time to something, it is, it is, it is admirable. Um, but I do like to use looks and kind of like put something quickly. And again, um, looks has so many capsules that can get you started super quick. So if you're not a colorist, if you don't know much about color grading, this is perfect because you can come here, preview it, and say, hey, I really like this. Uh, I, you, you apply it, and you're done. And you don't have to worry about anything. And um, in this case, I just played a little bit with the tools. As I mentioned, I just love oversaturated colors. That's my style. That's, what I, that's how I like it. Um, I think uh, if, you, if you watch the Across the Spider-Verse movie, that's basically what I'm shooting for, is that oversaturated, grudgy, a lot going on at all times type of look. And um, Lux is perfect for that. Um, and I just like use some of the tools. I use Mojo. I use chromatic aberration to give me that RGB separation, um, hue and saturation to boost my saturation. As you can see, there is like 150% at this point. And um, I use lens distortion to, to to give me that effect of uh, of distorting the lens. Um, I added Renoiser, and Renoiser is great because it allows me to add noise per RGB um, channel. So if I don't want my reds to be noise, then I can, I can do that. It gives me a lot of customization. And who doesn't like a good glow, <laughs> right? Um, optical diffusion is great because it's physically accurate. It is diffusing some sort in, 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 a, in a 3D, uh, 3D style. It is not just a filter. It's not just a glow filter applied on top of everything. It is physically accurate. And um, after spending like two minutes in looks, I'm done and I'm ready to go. That's it. It's, I think all of this setup together, it took me like five to seven minutes. And it's, it's super quick. Um, Universe has a bunch of interesting generators that allows you to combine with the effects uh, that we provide, with the stylized effects we provide. Um, in this example here, I was able to create some sort of a liquidy background, a bit iridescent type of look. Um, let me just zoom out a little bit. So if I were to click here on my solid, uh, the way this started is just the fractal background. And fractal background is perfect. Uh, if you want to generate some sort of a fractal noise, but also give you the customization of a background. So if you want to change color, if you want to animate, this is quick. And let me just showcase you how, it is, it is, how easy it is to achieve something like this. I'm just create a new solid, name it Factor Background, um, search for Fractal Background, apply. And again, because we provide so many capsules, I don't even have to... Um, um, I don't have to, let me just reset this real quick. Um, I don't have to bother to learn the tools too much in depth. I can just come in here and search for something that I like. Let's say this. This looks good. And done. Boom. It's, my noise is generated. My background is generated. Um, and from there, it's just a matter of playing, um, playing with the customizations. And it's super easy to play with something like this. And you don't have to worry about keyframes. If I were to, say, add a value for scroll to, to Y, let's say 10, and now if I were to play, you can see that it's animated. So you don't have to deal with the mess of keyframing, playing with expressions, or anything like that. It just does it for you. Um, let me go back the way it was. Um, so this is the, the, the fractal background that kind of like I used it as a base, um, and then I combine it with a stylized effect from Universe, which is called Prince Displacement. It's basically taking your noise and then creates a displacement mat 
uh, based on grayscale, and then just try to like displace it around. And I just played with the customization here, and it's it's really just free customizations that allows you to create this liquidy, prismatic, iridescent look, which is class refraction, uh, reflective index, and how how much do you want to soften your displacement map? So if I were to like play with this, you can see how it interacts with my fractal background. Um, and it is two effects, and all of a sudden we have a liquid uh, background. So you don't need to know about simulation. You don't need to like complicate yourself. It's literally two effects on a solid, and um, it gave me the, the outcome that I was looking for. Um, after I, after I um, combine these two effects, I just like pre-comp um, um, pre everything. Let me just go back here. Uh, let me just so and after that um, I was looking to kind of like customize the look of it and um, we don't have just looks which is perfect for that we also offer um, colorista which is a very good color grading tool and I love to work with colorista because it allows me to um, color grade and play with the colors and manipulate them super quick um, by just uh, using the interactive tools that we offer here. And that's how I was able to pretty much take some of my, um, some of my blues and reds and push them towards the purple, towards the pinks and so on. Uh, let me just go back real quick. And this is the, the outcome that I was able to, to achieve by just combining free two universe effects with one uh, red giant effect. Um, and you can also, if you want to iterate it real quickly, um, you can apply looks again to your background. And as a compositor, I like to use looks kind of like in a compositing way. It's just I like to manipulate colors to iterate. So I, I like to like take the same thing, but just change it slightly. Um, in case I'm looking for, for different combinations. Um, and there's two very great tools for that. Uh, one would be color remap, um, which allows you to pick a color and then remap it to another color. It's, it's a very quick way to change colors. Um, so if I were to, like, let's say, p pick my pinks here, I can say, hey, just make it yellow. And now it's yellow. It is that simple. And all of a sudden, you have a, a second version of your liquid background. Um, and the second, the second uh, tool that it's able to allow me to iterate real quick, it is a channel mixer. Um, it works in a three by three metrics, and I learned that from Max. So <laughs> thank you, Max. Um, but it allows me to play with the colors in a way where I can change it so much that all of a sudden I have a second video background. So. You, you play with free tools and use looks to iterate real quick, and now you have two backgrounds, five backgrounds, ten backgrounds for your next video. Um, let's go to the next one. Um, here, I used Universe Heatwave in a different way. Um, for people that are f familiar with the Liquid uh, tool from After Effects, it allows you to like draw and pen brush and kind of like achieve liquidy effects and so on. Um, but I was having a problem to always preview it. It gets, it gets heavy very quick. Um, so that's how I, I, I just thought about, hey, what if I just use Heatwave, remove the blur, and just use it in a way of just getting some waves around. Uh, and that's how I was able to achieve this. And I'm just going to put something together real quick just to showcase how fast it is, actually. Um, let's just disable everything, create a text, Let's say, hello, IBC. Let's just center it real quick, maybe increase the size like that. I don't know, let's, let's change the, the phone to something more bulky a little bit. There you go. So I got my text. From here, um, After Effects has this um, 
feature where it allows you to auto trace real quick. So instead of like masking, as long as it is a shape layer, as long as it's something with alpha, you can auto trace the layer. And I don't have to like bother roto brushing or masking or anything like that. Um, I'm going to press V just to like get my selection tool. And I'm just going to select around the down edges, let's say like that. And from there, I'm just going to press shift and down. And now I got my, my distortion. I, I, it's basically just pushed all, all, all the, the, the down of the text all the way down. Um, and from here, I just applied Universe Heat Wave. And Heat Wave, it is perfect if you want to add that extra detail. If you were to shoot, say, let's say, something extremely warm, let's say a hot day, or a scene where you, you're panning around like a lava or something like that, and, it's, and you just want to showcase how hot it is, then Heat Wave is perfect for that. that that's what it does. But in this case, it is, it is used in, in, in a different way just to mimic the liquid, the liquidy uh, tool from After Effects. So all I did is just disable the blur, because I don't want any blur, and then kind of like play with the heat intensity, maybe put the flow speed down a little bit. And if you were to play now, you can see that things are already wiggling around. And it's just about customizing it to, to your liking. Um, I'm just going to remove the uh, direction. And if you want even more detail, if you want to have even more control, then all you have to do is open the distortion settings and play with the heat size. Um, in the background, Heat Wave has a noise map. And the, the um, distortion settings is able to control that noise map. And it gives you a lot of um, custo customability. So if I were to play with this a little bit, let's say this and that and play, and done. I got my text being wavy all of a sudden. And um, after that, it's just about combining things. Um, and if I were to bring back my heat wave text here, you can see that there's some sort of um, um, edge outline with some RGB displacement. So I'm going to just showcase how fast I got that uh, put together. So all you have to do it is applying um, shift channel to, to, to my heat wave text. Um, I'm going to disable everything except the red channel. So now everything is just red. And after that, it is just about duplicated once again. And this time, we're going to disable the red channel, but enable the green channel for green. So now everything is green. And then we're going to do it one more time. And um, disable the green channel, but enable the blue channel. So now everything is blue all of a sudden. And what you can do is play a little bit with the blending modes. So if I were to select the, the two first layers and change the blending mode from normal to screen, and maybe offset them just by a tiny bit, let's say a few frames like that. And if I were to press play, now all of a sudden I'm getting like this RGB wavy effect around my outlines. Um, and from here, really, what I, what I did is just to like pre-comp everything. So let me do that. Let's say text heat wave. And I use an effect called find edges just to like pretty much find all the edges within, within my composition. Uh, and I inverted it. So now my whites become blacks, and my blacks become white. And from here, I'm a big fan of Universe Unmold. For people that don't know what it does, it's basically staking your footage, and it removes the blacks, and it transforms it into an alpha channel. And you are even able to invert it, so it takes your whites, and now it makes uh, your footage um, um, in, in an alpha channel. And that's how I was able to like, create the outline with this RGB effect, like uh, very psychedelic way. Um, and from here, really, it's just about playing with some glows, making a background. I love optical glow from Red Giant because it gives me the look I want with just by just applying it. And it offers a lot of customization if you want to go in depth. 
But for me personally, especially when I'm creating fast, I just want to, to control the amount maybe, maybe the size of the diffusion, and then you're done. It's pretty much a few minutes, and you're able to, to achieve this. Um, for the background, it's literally the same concept showcased within the symbol map uh, um, example, where it's just one gradient playing with texturized motion, and you got your background ready. Uh, let's go to the next one. So I mentioned that I love gradients, and um, this is an example set up with just gradient ramp from Universe. So if I were to play this, this is, this is pretty much um, uh, the effect that I was able to achieve just by using gradients. So if you're interested to maybe take your footage a little bit to the next level, um, gradients are a great way to achieve that. And it's really just the footage that I imported. Um, I had a universe RGB separation just to get that RGB split effect. And after that, I play with gradient ramp just to get my first gradient. And then I applied another gradient, but this time I flipped the colors and I just created a circular mask. And then my third gradient, it's again, the gradient flipped again, uh, maybe changed the, the purples to be a bit more darkened, but with even smaller mask. And that's how I was able to like, put this circular effect just with gradients. And from there, I used compact blur from Universe combined with texturized motion to give you like this paper-like effect. And I'm just going to showcase how great it is to combine compound blur with texturized motion. So let me just import real quick my footage here. I have this footage that has like this camera lens uh, blur on top and a little bit of bokeh. There you go. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to apply compound blur to it. And after that, I'm going to create a new solid. Let's name it Texture. I'm going to search for texturized motion. And what's great about texturized motion is if you don't want it to be animated, all you have to do is change from cycle to still, and all of a sudden your textures don't just, they're still, they're no longer animated. And um, you all, all you have to do is change the blend mode from overlay, that's the default state, to normal, and disable the mask. And you got your texture quickly. Done. Um, from there, it's just about customizing to your liking. Now, Combat Blur works with, with grayscale, um, grayscale maps. So what I'm trying to achieve here is giving my texture that grayscale um, map. And I just have to like increase the contrast, uh, maybe change the pattern from concrete, let's say, to fuzzy. And I'm just going to pre-comp this. Let's, let's, let's just name it texture icon for now. So pre-comp, texturize comp. And I'm just going to unseen it because I don't want to have it available. I don't want it to, to see it right now. And I'm going to go back to, um, to compound blur. Comp Pound blur. And all you have to do is change the blur layer to the texture comp we created and just increase the, the size of the blur, let's say from 100 to, let's say, I don't know, 2,500. And that allows you to give you that extra, extra look, the extra touch. Um, and you can also apply levels to your textures if you want to bring back some of the blacks, some of the whites. So let me just do that real quick. And it's just about playing with them. Um, you can also change the pattern if that's what you like. Maybe, maybe that's, that, that'll bring you the, the look you're looking for. Um, and let me go back to the, um, to the composition that I had set up. And now you got, you got your footage, and now maybe you're looking to, to achieve that glass texture on top of it. Um, and we do offer that 
that um, that look as well. Let's say shatter here, which it's pretty much a glass texture that it's broken. And if I were to go back now, you can see that I'm getting my camera lens blur, but it gives me that extra touch of just glass feeling like. Um, so that's how I was able to achieve this paper-like effect. It's just combining gradient with universe compound blur and the textures, and all of a sudden you can put something together real quick for your video. The next example is something a bit more... That looks a bit more complex, but really it isn't. It is just playing with fractal background and then finding unique ways to like combine the effects, everything together. And it's really just one solid multiplied and duplicated for, let's say, five times, ten times, and then just playing with the colors and the gradient ramp. So if I were to go back here to my composition, you can see that it's just it is just fractal, fractal background, universe fractal background. And I'm just going to showcase how easy it is to set up something like this. Let me just make a new, a new solid. Let's name it, I don't know, noise for now. I'm going to search for fractal background. And again, because we provide so many capsules, it is much simpler for me to just choose one and start from there. So let's say I'm going to start with this one. Maybe I don't want any angle. Um, maybe I don't want to. I don't want any colors for now. Maybe I just want a black and white and color it later. So I'm just going to change my reds to to white, my my oranges to black, and I'm I'm you're done. You you're ready to like pretty much go to the next step. Um, it, it can also like blur uh, horizontally or vertically, and um, it it works very nice especially if you, if you work with uh, displacement maps. And in this case, I just blur it horizontally just to kind of blend a little bit some of the lines and remove some of the complexity. And after that, you can apply uh, polar coordinates. Let me just pre-comp it first. And you can apply polar coordinates, crank that up. And it looks kind of weird for now. But that's OK, because you can just change to react the opposite way. And all of a sudden, you got your circle. So that's how I was able to put together the, the, the circle that I needed with the noise. And as I mentioned, it's already animated. I don't have to like struggle. I don't have to bother about it. it, it just, it's, it's already animated um, based on my liking. So if I were to go back now to the background um, and solo this, and play it, it is, it is already doing the things that I want it to do. Um, I have a little bit of animation here where it's, it starts with opacity 0, and then it goes all the way to 100. But my circles are already animated. And from there, it's just playing with it. It's just duplicating it a bunch of times. Maybe change the rotation around it and change the color. And that's it. A, have a camera to play around. Um, I link the camera to a null because it's easier to like control things, and you can pretty much just choose any angle you're interested in to to play with and and uh, customize it based on your liking and so on. Um, and after that, I used a Universe Finisher, which is great if you want to just add a little bit of oomph, a little bit of detail to your uh, to your composition. And it gives you like this way of enhancing your contrast. Um, maybe add some saturation. Maybe bring back some of your details by sharpening your composition. And then, uh, and then you're done. And that's how I was able to achieve this. It's super quick, it, real fast. And I got my background with text um, animated. Um, for the next example, I just used... Um, Universal Ray Gun, which is great if you want to like put together a background and create motion graphic elements. And I combined it with Chromaton, which is basically taking your footage and then create some sort of a chromatic spread around. So not a chromatic separation only, but also it like spreads around, around and it gives you options to like customize it. Maybe you want to rotate your spread. Maybe you want to move your spread. Maybe you have, want to have like different points from your spread should be, um, should be picked off. And I'm just going to showcase how fast I did this by just combining these two effects. I'm just going to create a new solid, name it background, search for a ray gun. 
apply it. And I'm just going to remove the, the, the background. I don't need that for now. I'm going to open line grid, disable the grid. Uh, maybe I'm going to add a little bit less columns in a row. So let's do that. Let's say four columns, um, six rows. And what I like about Raygun is that it allows me, again, to animate things super quickly. So you don't need to bother with keyframes. Um, so to do that, you can just like open the shape grid go all the way down to animation settings. And here, there's a bunch of options that you can choose from. Um, in this case, let's just enable everything. Let's animate size. Let's animate rotation. Let's, let's animate position. Let's animate opacity. And just, just be playful about it. So I want the animation to, to be, um, um, I want the opacity, opacity to be animated all the way to 100. So that means that it, it goes in a random way from 0 to 100. And uh, we even provide um, some sort of um, expression preset. So if I wanted to oscillate, I can do that. So if I were now to play this background, let me just solo it real quick and just play it. You can see that it oscillates around. And it's just, it just animates things for me with just, with, by clicking two buttons. Uh, let's say I don't want it to go that fast. Let's just make it twice as slow. And um, you pretty much done. This this was the base that I needed for my chromatic spread. So from here, uh, I just increased the size a little bit and went right into Chroma Town. And I like to um, I like to change my follow from none to triangle in, triangle out. And um, after that, it's about picking my start point and my end point uh, where I decide what I wanted to spread my chromatic spread. So I'm just going to move the start point somewhere, somewhere here. And then I'm going to go to the end point and pick it, let's say, somewhere here. By default, it's both of them in the center. So it's just about playing with them and experimenting. Um, so let's just leave it that way. And from now on, if you want to increase the amount of passes that it has, Right now, it is set to 30, so it, it, it creates a chromatic spread through 30 passes. All you have to do is just to, incre to increase the uh, quality from 30 to 100, and all of a sudden, I have more passes. Um, and from here on, it's just about playing. Maybe, maybe you, you think it's a little bit empty, so you just go back to a ray gun and add more columns and rows. Let's say 8, let's say I don't know, 10. Uh, maybe maybe you don't like the, the colors that you currently have, so you just go back to the shape grid, and there's different ways you can color things here, and we provide presets for that as well. Maybe, maybe there's another way you like to color things. Um, maybe you just want one color. Um, I like to play with many colors, um, so in, uh, in the previous case, I just changed the blue to, let's say, something more pink-like, and... Um, I just continued playing with the settings I, until I got the, what I was looking for. So that's how I was able to achieve this. And if you want, if you want to add an extra uh, level of detail to it, all you have to do is duplicate the layer and search for Find Edges, apply it, and just invert the effect. Let me solo it. And that's how I was able to create that edge around my uh, uh, chromatic spread. Um, even this could be in itself another background. Maybe you just have optical glow and you're done. Um, but that's how I was able to achieve that edge around my background here if I were to zoom in. Um, and after that, I was just looking to add a simple text in the middle, which again, I, I just use typographic, pick a preset, add universe RGB separation, and you're done. You're good to go. So if I were to play this, that's how I was able to, to achieve this in a couple minutes. It's, it's, really, it's really not that hard. Um, so let me just go to the next one. Um, or maybe you guys already have any questions, maybe? before I uh, go to the next one. One thing that I really forgot to mention is that 
if you said something in your NLE, let's say Premiere Pro, or maybe you like to work in DaVinci, what I like about Universe is that you can save your presets and then they'll be immediately available in your host choice. And that gives you a lot of portability and versatility to work with. Uh, we work with basically anybody. So it's up to you what you prefer to work with. Um, we make it extremely easy and convenient so you can move things around by just using the, the um, universe dashboard. So yeah, I think, um, I think that was it from my side for today. Um, and um, I'm actually looking forward to see your artwork and see what you can create with Universe and Ray Giant tools and how can you combine things in interesting ways. Um, and um, I'm very excited. Um, we love to share artwork. We love to talk about our users. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, the community is what makes this the best. It is what inspires me. It is, it is what wakes me up the next morning and is makes me think, hey, I combine things in this way, but then I talk with somebody who uses our tools in different ways, and it just makes me excited to, to start my day like that. Um, so yeah, um, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for coming. And um, yeah, um, looking forward.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the node editor, even better Redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system this means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh. Or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new node editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, new nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. All through this year, we've been regularly releasing new sets of capsules. Maxon's collection of tailor-made materials, models, and nodal assets to help you kickstart your projects, including plant assets by Laubwerk, home decor models by Pavel Zoch, and redshift materials by Fuchs and Vogel that are perfect for architectural visualization, product shots, and motion graphics. There's also a new brake spline modifier by Rocket Lasso, which allows you to evenly or randomly subdivide splines with spacing, great for creating dynamic stacks with objects swept along curves. Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to easily use 3D tracking data to accurately place flares in a scene, or direct your flare with a parallel light or spotlight cone angle. You can also now control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. 
Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great for those classic 1970s and 80s movie looks. And in what is sure to be a favorite, schmutz can now be illuminated by the background, or your flare, or both. To help you work more efficiently in Real Lens Flares, we've also added a draft mode. Simply enable draft mode on your After Effects layer, and the render quality will be reduced by a factor of 4 to increase performance. When you go to render, draft mode is automatically ignored, and your flare is rendered at full quality. And remember that Real Lens Flares and many of these new features are also now available in Adobe Premiere Pro. Universe has hundreds of presets to help you get started, and this release adds over 50 new presets to inspire your creativity and give your designs and edits a head start. Magic Bullet Looks also adds dozens of new presets to give you even more options for professional creative color grades. Also, the OCIO configuration in your After Effects project is now seen and synchronized with Magic Bullet Looks, so you don't have to worry about getting consistent color throughout your pipeline. Trapcode Particular has hot new features, introducing Combustion, a new fluid dynamics option to create fiery looks with particular particles. Control attributes like temperature over life as particles ignite and then turn to smoke. If you've ever created particle trails from a parent and had to increase the particle account significantly in order to create a line, now with the new stroke from parent feature, those lines are created for you automatically. Create particle trails and tails fast and easy and at perfect quality while still having control over essential attributes such as size, color, and opacity over life.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the node editor, even better redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object, creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct Pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new Normal Editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new node editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, New nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. Welcome back, everyone. Um, hope everyone is doing well. We now have Ploy Motion, who is a 2D and 3D motion designer from London. And she's been doing this for over 10 years. So that's amazing and incredible. So she has a lot of knowledge. Uh, you can have a chat with her after the presentation because she'll be around. Um, she's going to talk about faking it to making it, uh, creative problem solving with Cinema 4D and After Effects. All yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, my God, I can hear my voice. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thanks to everyone uh, tuning in online. Thanks to everyone here today. Um, and thank you very much to Maxon for inviting me here. Um, I love learning all the time, and I've watched so many of these videos by Maxon, so um, it's honestly an absolute privilege to be presenting today. Um, let's get my showreel out of the way. And I'm in the middle of working on my new one, so this is my current one. I will get it up now.
so I'm a freelance 2D and 3D motion designer. I'm a dirty generalist. And um, I love my fingers in all the pies, as gross as that sounds. Um, I want to do all of the things. And um, the majority of my experience is in film and TV advertising. Um, but since going freelance, I've branched out into a lot of other industries, including brands, music, live events, and medicine. Today, I'm going to be showing you a few of my projects where I've faked a technique or not done something in a way that you'd expect uh, to get the result that I'm after. Um, I'm hoping that what we'll go through today might help you in any of your future projects. Um, so the first project I'm going to show you is a personal project I made during lockdown. Um, I read an article claiming that a few companies were the biggest plastic polluters worldwide and had been for a number of years. I thought of what a sea of plastic waste would look like, and I imagined this huge wave coming and crashing down instead of water. Um, I wanted to make this animation to draw attention to these companies and how bad single-use plastics are. So uh, this is the animation that I made. So I'll just show you the wave again, because that's what I'm just going to go through in a second. Sorry. So let me go into cinema. Um, so because I'm working on a laptop today, I've cached um, dynamics just so that you don't have to watch um, all of the bottles kind of calculating. But this is kind of what I've got here. Um, and the idea is that you've got this makeshift C, which is a plane. And if I just hide that and come out of my camera, you can see here that um, what I've got here is just a, um, a cube. Let me hide those. Um, it's, got, it's a cube with um, a lot of subdivisions. Um, and I've also got a taper to, at the, at the peak of the wave, you've got kind of like it gets smaller. So I kind of added that there. Um, and then I've got a bend deformer, which is here. Now, the bend deformer is not a child of the wave, because what I wanted was the wave to come up and into the um, into the bender former so that it starts curling towards the camera so it's not bent to begin with. Um, now, this cube is a collider. Um, so you've got the, all of these bottles that, as I said, I've cached them. So um, these bottles are following the cube and making that wave look. So if I hide the geometry, um, I don't know why it's looking like that, because it should be cached differently. Um, but yeah, so when you watch it, it's kind of got that look, but you've got all of the interactions of the bottles as they, um, as they come up and go curl around. Now, the curl of the wave was something that I really, really wanted. And um, like obviously, this is a, a low poly version, just to show you guys um, the, sort of the basics of how I made this wave. Um, but one of the, the challenges for me was that I really wanted, the idea was that the wave was going to come around and then almost like it was interacting with the camera. Once the wave came crashing over, it would push the camera under the water. And before that happened, I really wanted that lovely kind of curl that you see at, underneath the wave. Like, I'm sure a lot of you have seen those photos um, of, of surfers and things like that. And I also wanted the bottles to start breaking at the end of the wave. And it might seem simple to a lot of other people, but for me, I struggled a lot with how to make that kind of the look of the bottles falling. And in the end, I actually came up with a, a really, really um, seemed obvious once I'd done it, but it was, it was frustrating for a while. So basically, um, as I said, I've got this cached. Um, but so you can see um, these, the wave here, you've got all of these um, polygons here. Now you need those polygons whenever you're doing dynamics um, because you don't want things um, jumping out of the geometry. So the more geometry we have, the more calculations it can make between the objects it's trying to contain and then the object that it's pushing against. So um, what I did to, in order to get that break of the bottles coming out at the top, like I said, very simple. If I go into polygon mode up here, and um, all I needed to do was get rid of these polygons at the top here. So if I press UL for loop selection and click here, and then press UF, um, for fill selection, I can select the top here and then just delete it. Um, and then I'm going to switch over to my other cache project because this is a laptop. Um, and I, I, blah, 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 blah. let me see if I can come out there. Okay, so um, as you can see, it's exactly the same thing. Um, 
except where we go. Oh dear, something's frozen. <gasps> My goodness, the laptop is frozen. <laughs> oh no. I don't know what to do. Um, oh, of course this would happen. I'm so sorry. What have I done? <laughs> Did I crash it? <laughs> I'll start it again, that's fine. It's lucky I cashed it. <laughs> There we go. All right. Yeah, I'll try again. That's fine. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I assume I've gone the shade of a very ripe tomato. So let's just wait for this to uh, load up. Lucky I cached it. So you don't have to watch me do that again. Um, so anyway, let me try again. So. This is the, um, the cube, as I mentioned, and now it's missing the top. So if you watch these cache dynamics, um, you'll see that the wave comes over, and now they fall out, which is kind of what I wanted. Um, but I still, one of the things about a wave is that you, when it forms, it's pulling energy from all different sides. And um, something that I was really, really keen on is um, having the I called it the underpool. I assume it's like undercurrent or something, but it's basically you've got the wave um, coming from the left-hand side um, so that I didn't have to worry about what it looked like on the left-hand side because the wave comes into the shot. But all, you've got all of these bottles um, with my, if I show you, with my makeshift C. Um, so you've got all these bottles that are floating in front of the camera. And I wanted to show those bottles kind of being dragged into the wave. So um, I... I Really, ideally, I wanted to do it with dynamics, but it just took me so long to try and work out how it was going to work without, because this, this wave was so full of bottles. If I'd used dynamics, every time I tried, the bottles would like just bounce and like just go crazy um, elsewhere. So what I ended up doing was a very simple, dirty kind of trick. So I'm just going to hide the wave for a second. And I'm going to hide the C. So <clears throat> and let's take my camera out. So what I've got here is a plane, and um, this is basically how I did it for my project as well. So um, I just got um, a plane that is animating from right to left, and then I've also, as you can see, I've got an, a, another bend deformer. It's not a child, so that the plane bends into um, the bend deformer. And then if I go back into the camera, you can see that it also creates um, that lovely curl as well, which I'm looking for, so it kind of emphasizes that look. Um, and then we've got this a very low poly bottle here. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to hold Alt and add it to a cloner. And then instead of it being in grid mode, I'm going to change it to object. And then I'm going to take the plane that goes into the bender former and use that as the object that I'm cloning onto. Let me come out so you can actually see what I'm doing. Um, there, the bottles are facing the wrong way. I want them to mostly look like they're going into the wave. So uh, if I just go into the transform, I think it's this one. Yeah, there it is. Um, and I'm not going to bore you with trying to, you know, um, like separate them and make sure that they're they're all uh, not intersecting. But I am going to increase the size, so you, um, the amount, sorry, so that you can see. So if I hide the plane, bring back the C, um, and bring back the wave with the cache dynamics, uh, like this. Hopefully, what you can see is kind of what I was going for. So you can see that. Um, at this point, you don't have to worry because, well, I didn't have to worry because the camera went under the water. So I didn't have to worry about what was happening with the dynamics at that point. And I think the main worry for me was if I had dynamics and then this kind of fake sort of look of these bottles being pulled in, that you'd see that gap between the two. But I think there's enough going on. And um, because these are just, you know, low poly bottles, but the bottles that I had looked, you know, they were modeled like regular bottles. So you've got, you can't really see all those interactions. So it's just what you can get away with, um, what your eye can sort of like detect and not detect is, is always something important to keep in mind um, when you're doing your projects, because you can make it look perfect and you can make it look correct in, in like sort of like the real world or whatever. But if you can get away with something that's quick and dirty, then 
Why not, basically? So, um, so that's my wave. Um, let me jump into a, another project. Um, where's my thing? OK, so um, this here is another project, um, another personal project that I made. Um, please don't play. OK, we're good. Um, so I, I'm sure most of you have heard of a TV show called Squid Game. And some of you might have heard of an animation called Dumb Ways to Die, which was um, made uh, for an Australian train company. Um, but basically, I did a combination of the two. And I'm not going to play you the whole video, but I will just play you a section um, of it. So here it is. Apologies in advance for my terrible singing. Running away from a targeting gun. Control your fate by picking number one. Confront a killer for stealing your food. Give all your marbles to your gamboo. Dumb ways to die. So many dumb ways to die. Dumb ways to die. So many dumb ways to die. So um, that was my little thing. I did, I did the, whole game, uh, the whole song sorry, with most of the, the deaths in there. They were quite fun to do and to think of. Um, so what I'm going to show you today is basically what I, how I created the hair for the characters. Because um, basically, let me just go back into this. Um, and I'm going to just mute it. So this bit at the end of the chorus where they turn, most of this stuff was done in After Effects with rubber hose. So all of the characters and CC Cylinder for the bodies, CC Sphere for the heads. But for the hair, I really wanted it to look nice when they turn. I, wanted, I didn't want it to just be flat kind of textures on, on the heads. So um, I tried a lot of things in After Effects where, for example, you, you can have like a null that's set back in 3D space, and then you can rotate everything and have it facing the camera so that it almost creates that look as it's rotating that the hair is there. But I just, you know, after a few hours, I was just kind of like, I need to just do it in cinema. Like, as much as everything else is done in After Effects, it's like it's way quicker and way easier to do it in cinema. So what I thought of, what I, the way I, use, I like to work is that I try and do the most difficult part first, if I can, and for me, out of all the characters, Ali, I don't know if you guys remember him, he's the one that gave his, his rock bag away. Um, he was very upset about that. So um, Ali, his hair is beautiful and it's long and curly and I was like, that's the hardest hair. Either him or the, the crazy lady. Um, I don't want to give any spoilers away and, and this video does give a lot of spoilers. Anyway, I'll just start talking about Ali. So uh, this is my little Ali illustration that I made in Illustrator. And then um, in order to make his hair, it was really simple. I've got a sphere that represents his head. Um, I'll go into that a bit more in a bit why I've, I've put that in there. But basically, um, his hair is quite high. So instead of just creating the hair on, on his, the, the, the sphere that's representing his head, I made another sphere. And then if I pull it up, and then I kind of, um, let me press C to make it editable. I basically made it a bit taller so that I don't have to use as many spheres in the cloner to cover all of that space because it's, it's already, the geometry is already there. So I'm going to use this as my um, hair driver. If I can spell. There we go. Cool. Um, and I'm just going to grab another sphere. And that is going to be the basis for my alley hair. So I'm just going to make it about that size, put it there just so I can see it. So this is um, his hair, and this is his head. OK, so with the hair, I'm just going to, again, hold Alt and um, click on Cloner to make it automatically a child. And then with the Cloner, instead of Grid, I'm going to choose Object and then use the hair driver as the, um, the object I want to clone onto. Now, I'm going to massively increase this. And again, I'm not going to make you guys watch um, me try and make it look perfect. But I'll give you a, a rough idea of kind of like how I made it. So that's kind of 
Ali, and let's go. Oh, God, I've got to use F1. There we go. Um, so his hair's relatively covered. I'll just add a few more, I think. Ah, go away. There we go. Um, OK, so first of all, I added a random effector to um, just randomize some of the, that's not the right one, um, randomize the size. Um, and I wanted it to be uniform. So if you go into parameter and take off position um, and then just change the scale. So I wanted it all to be uniform. I don't want any of the spheres to be squished in any particular direction. I just want them to be spheres, but just different sizes. So I'll just randomize it by like uh, 0.3 maybe. Uh, not uniform, sorry, not absolute. There we go, that makes sense. Point three, we're going to work. There we go. Okay, so that's roughly it. Um, and obviously, we don't want hair all over the front of his face. So um, what you do is, um, I, with the planer selected, I'll just add a, um, a plane effector. And again, I'm affecting the scale, not the position. So I click it down here. Uh, it's uniform, and it's uh, if you add minus one to the scale, it basically gets rid of them all. But I only want it to disappear from the front of his face. So uh, if you go into fields, and I think for this one I, I used a box field. And so the plane effector is only affecting any clones that are inside this field. So you can see here, you've got, uh, as I move it around, it's affecting certain areas. It's also affecting the color, which I don't want to do. So I'm just going to go back into my plane effector. And there's this little button here that changes whether it affects color or not. So I'm just going to turn that off. Very useful for other projects, but not for this one. So um, all I need to do is just rotate it a little bit and change the scale a little bit, just so we can show a lot of his face. We obviously don't have a lot of hair on our neck as well, which is why I've rotated this cube. So it's kind of like that. I could probably get away with a a linear um, field as well, but I just I think I chose box um, for whatever reason. So anyway, we've relative we've got like a relatively good look there. And then um, the other thing that I didn't want was all of these little um, spheres that aren't connected. So you can actually change that in the um, remapping of your field. So if you click on your box field and then go to remapping, you can change the inner offset. So you can see as I reduce the inner offset, it's creating more of a gradient. So you've got um, the, the spheres are very gradually going from, from disappearing to like back to their original size. And then if I increase it, you get a much bigger, a, a much harsher fall off um, of gradient. So that's, that's roughly where I wanted it to be. So you can see that there. And then if I go back into my front view, ah, no, that's not what I want at all. Sorry. There we go. Um, I'm just going to hide the hair cloner. And I don't need to see the hair driver anymore. Um, so with all of my characters, I really felt like, because they're so simply designed, that they, the hair was a really, really good big part of being able to tell the difference between them. Um, and so I was really, really careful about how um, you could basically instantly pick up on which character it was trying to, I was trying to sort of like show um, a lot through the hair. So with Ali, he always has this fringe, this really gorgeous curly fringe at the front. Sorry, I'm very jealous of his hair. Um, so basically, I really wanted to make sure that I, I showed that. So um, if I just take another sphere, I'll just duplicate it by holding control as I drag. Um, and then let's just go back to this view. Uh, with this one, I just manually placed a few of these um, spheres. Let's go back to front view. And then drag that up here. So yeah, um, I just kind of held control to create some new spheres, change their size, and made sure that I was basically c um, copying my illustrator design as, as closely as, as I could before I, um, I brought it into After Effects, which I will be doing in a second. So let's go. And then you have to make sure that, well, I had to make sure that it was in front of his head instead of inside his head. So these are OK. And then this last one, just push that back a bit. And so yeah, I won't make you watch it all. <laughs> but that's, that's kind of the idea. So um, let me go back into here. Sorry. There we go. 
Um, there we go. OK. So let's imagine that that's all perfect. Um, and basically, the whole idea of, um, of having his, his face, I needed his head in there as well, because when rendering, I wanted the, um, I didn't want to see the back of the hair. And in order to obscure it, I needed to put another, geom uh, another piece of geometry in there that would basically obscure the back of the head so that when it rotates, um, you get to see the face that's in After Effects because it's, it's, a, um, it's a sphere, but it's, it is essentially 2D in After Effects. So you need to kind of like counter for that. So this is what I did. Um, I'm in standard, uh, no external renderers or anything, and you just create a new default material. This is, I'm going to call, there we go. I'm going to call hair. And all I did for this was I um, turned off color and reflectance and turned on luminance. And then I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add all of this hair to its own null by holding Alt-G. It creates a null with everything inside. I'm going to call that hair. I know everything's called hair. I'm terrible at naming things. Um, so I'm going to add the luminance material to the hair. And then I'm going to create a new material. Um, OK, I finally do it there. I'm going to call that face. And I'm going to turn off reflectance. So the only thing I want to do here is um, make sure that it's black. Now, I'm going to put that on the head like that. Um, and then if you have a look at this, this is basically what I'm after is like you've got the white hair, but you've got the face obscured. So if I t turn off the head, you can see what it would look like without the head in there. So you need, you need that there so that when you go into After Effects, the face is not, um, is not obscured by all of this hair. So um, the other thing, I don't know, maybe everyone else knows this, but I did not. Um, in After Effects, I just use the standard Easy Ease for um, the characters. So when they're rotating, it's actually just you know the regular, you press F9 and the Easy Ease comes in. Now with Cinema, when you put keyframes in, it automatically comes with an ease. It's the same. So I was really happy when I discovered that. Um, it's the same speed. So I was able to um, just rotate it. I didn't have to make it linear and then change the ease in, in After Effects. I could just do it standard out of cinema, and it, and it matched up perfectly. So I was really happy with that. So um, what I did, so when it comes to rotations, um, particularly when you're matching um, something from cinema and or, or rotations in general, you have to think about where the rotation, the axes is. And if I, for example, if I uh, selected my hair and my head, it, and then I grouped it together into a null, which is essentially what I want to do, um, the axes would choose somewhere halfway between all of the objects that are selected. But that's not what I want, because the head is the central point. That's where I want the rotation to be. So what I tend to do is, if I know where I want the axes to be, from, like taken from a particular object, instead, I will make, um, I will hold Alt. Oh, no, is it Alt? Shift, I think. Um, and then with the objects that I want to copy the axes of, I will hold Shift and then press Null. And then it becomes, automatically becomes a child of that object. But it also, um, if you go into the coordinates, you can see that it's zeroed out because it's taken on all of the properties, um, location properties, coordinate properties, sorry, of that object. So now, when I put the hair and the head into that null, the rotation po um, point, the axis point, oops. <laughs> um, I think I need to put the hair driver in there as well. So um, yeah, the axis is right in the center of the, the face. So if I, for example, not that I needed to um, for this, this character, but if I needed to move it up and down and the axis point was not in the head, you'd have like this weird movement because the, the hair would be moving up and down as you're rotating it. So, so yeah, that's, that's something to note if, if ever you're going from cinema to After Effects. Your rotation points are, are very important. So anyway, I'm just going to set a uh, keyframe. I think it's this one. Yeah, it is. So I'm just going to do 0, and then I'm going to go all the way over to this side, and I'm going to uh, set a keyframe for 360, and do that. So you can see, lovely rotation. We're going to accept that he doesn't have all of these bald spots there. Like, let's pretend they don't happen. Um, and then 
I rendered that out as an image sequence and then brought it into After Effects. Now, I'm going to um, just use the lovely um, hair from Ali that I made for my project instead of that terrible mess that I just showed you there. Um, so, go away. So, um, this is my little Ali um, dancing and singing, crying and dead. Um, and basically, all I'm going to be doing is, um, let's see, let's bring this up. So you can see all of this stuff here. This is from um, Rubber Hose, which is absolutely brilliant. If you've never done uh, used Rubber Hose before, you need to have a look at the uh, 2D character stuff. It's, it's great. So um, I'm not going to use that one. Where is it? There we go. So I'm just going to bring the hair in. Um, and it's very, very um, short. So all I've done is I've rendered out the one single rotation. I don't need to render out anything else because I can use the rest of it with time remap. So if um, I will just scale it down. And I'm going to add, uh, I'm going to just set it to screen just so that I can line it up properly. OK, let's say that's, that's about right. Um, now, the other reason why I didn't color his hair in, um, in cinema was because there are a lot of other characters. Um, and I wasn't sure whether I wanted them to have like completely black hair or off black. And there's, there's characters like old Ilnam and um, the main character forgotten his name, um, but the one at the end where he like dyes his hair red, I've actually got him in the video as well. So it's like I wanted control over the colors um, and not have to go back into cinema to render those. So that's why I did it this way. The idea is to render it out so I can use it as a luma mat, um, and then I can change the color to whatever I want um, on the fly in After Effects. So um, I'm just going to create a new solid, and I'm going to use that hair that I've just made and brought in. I'm going to change the mat to be 30. And then I'm going to change it to be a luma mat. So you can see at the moment he's got gray hair, because that's a dark gray solid. And let me bring in uh, effect controls. And we want to add a fill. Ah, Everything's too big. OK, there we go. So yeah, now he's got red hair. Um, but actually, he's got black hair. So that's what I kind of did. Now, um, with most of the dancing, it's kind of like he's just rotating left and right. And, and with uh, the body is, sorry, the head is following the body. So all I needed to do was parent um, the, the hair, and I'm going to parent the solid as well, to his face, because his face is already um, parented correctly to the rest of his body. So. Um, I'm also, just so you can see, I'm going to add um, a, a time remapping to it. And I'm just going to drag that out here, drag that out there. So for his dancing, you can see that the hair out of cinema, because it's currently it's, it's not um, animating, it's just the frozen first frame. So uh, yeah, he's just dancing along, and the hair's following him really, really well. Now. What I needed to do was find out where the rotation was. So I've got my little keyframe set up here so that you don't have to watch me do it. But um, what I wanted to do was find the rotation and move the keyframes accordingly to that, which is there, like that. And then when you watch it, hopefully he'll rotate. Yeah. So the hair is rotating with him. Um, and because the, key, the, uh, the easy ease is the same in cinema as After Effects, the standard easy ease, um, it, it just works really seamlessly. So I was really, really lucky with that. I didn't have to worry about graphs or anything. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of like Ali's hair. And um, I did basically the same thing with a different character later on in the video. Um, instead of him rotating, he's coming down a slide because he gets shot in the head from breaking some cookies. Um, so yeah, um, it's exactly the same principle. But instead of left and right, he's um, rotating 
that way. I don't know what that is. Up and down. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like how I made all of those characters. Um, and if you want to watch the video, it's on YouTube or my website. Um, how are we doing for time? We're good. OK, so um, another project I wanted to show you was um, this is a very recent project, so I can't actually show you the animation, but I can show you, excuse me, um, I can show you um, how I made something for the project, which I found, like, um, basically, I watched a video by Rocket Lasso, um, Chris Schmidt, and he was talking about how to make um, a liquid surface dynamic, so that when you're moving the glass or the, or the, uh, the container around, the liquid is um, reacting dynamically. Um, I had a project where I had two characters and they were walking really fast to the table and they picked up their glasses and then they cheers and I needed the liquid to look like it was reacting as if you would expect liquid to, make, uh, to react. The issue I had was I tried, um, I tried X particles, um, the car everything was moving too fast that the, the particles just kept um, escaping out of the containers. I tried bullet dynamics where you've got like loads of little spheres and I hoped that that would kind of like create, I also was really hoping that would work because I think you'd get some of those splashes that come out because the, the balls would kind of like fly out as, as everything gets um, knocked together, but it just didn't work. And, and the t everyone has this where you have these really tight time constraints and you have to come up with something that looks good enough. Um, and then I tried Chris Schmidt's um, method where um, I mean, I, I can go through it a little, little bit because actually it didn't work for me because, again, it was still dynamics and everything was moving too, in too small a window that even with the cloth dynamics, the new cloth dynamics, it was just, it wasn't working. So I'll, um, I'll go through what I did um, and I will let you know when I've kind of deviated from Rocket Lasso's video. So this is kind of, if you look at the red liquid, that's the results that I came up with. Um, so it looks relatively OK. Um, it's enough for what I needed for the video. So um, this, none of this is dynamic. This is um, keyframes. Um, but I did use a lot of what I learned from the, the Rocket Lasso, vid Lasso video. So um, I will show you that now. Uh, let's get rid of the red one. And I'm just going to hide you so that you don't calculate. Right, so here's our blue glass. We have got um, the glass and... Right, so I've got... Um, let's turn that off. Okay, so um, where's my camera? There it is, okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so we've got a glass and what I did was I took the inside of the glass and then I put a top, uh, sorry, I separated the inside of the glass geometry and then I put a top on it to create the liquid inside. So that's the maximum that I would want the liquid to be at. I don't want it to go any higher because I don't want it to spill out of the glass. Um, and this is fake dynamics as well, so we can't do that. Um, I'm sure someone else could. But yeah, um, what I did was if you bring in a, um, I brought in a cube and uh, I also, this is from, this is what I learned from the, the Rocket Lasso video. Basically, um, there's these geometry nodes, which I've only just started using, but it's, they're really, really powerful, and they're part of like the capsules, I think, that come with your Maxon subscription, and they like update it every month or something. But um, I needed to subdivide only one side, because I don't want to create extra subdivisions where I don't need them because then it, it takes a lot longer to calculate certain things. So with, if you ever need, I, like, I don't know how to use the, um, like there's a lot of coding that goes into a lot of this and like you can, you can select certain surfaces using numbers, but I just knew I needed this bottom one. So if you have the polygon selected and then you add the, the subdivision node, so I'm just, obviously I've added it here. Uh, is it gonna show NB? There we go. So you can see that on this side, we've got four polygons, four polygons. But because, ah, what happened? <laughs> Let me try again. There we go. Um, so you can see that with this subdivide on and off, it's only applying it to, um, to that selected surface, which is really, really useful for calculations because it's only creating extra information on, on that surface, which is where I need it. Um, so I will go into the displacer in a minute. 
So basically all I did was um, I used a volume builder and um, I'd taken the, the blue, con blue filled container that you saw and then, let me see, and then I've, um, with that box, I selected the box to subtract. So what's happening is um, you've got the container and then it's removing anything that is the box, which is the, the big blue box there. So you can see that it's being cut off where that box starts. Now, what I did was, um, I'm gonna just keep Volume Builder off for a second and I'm gonna remove the lines so you don't have to see them. Um, I went through the animation and I found the peak points at which I think I thought the liquid would rotate a certain way. So if I just kind of like scroll through, you can see that I've rotated, I keyframed the, let's come out a bit more. Um, I keyframed the box and I'm gonna turn this off as well. There we go, sorry. So I've keyframed the box to rotate in ways that I think that the, um, the liquid would move. And then it just kind of like, it obviously looks a bit janky. It's quite um, simple. So if I just turn the volume builder and mesh it on, you can see how it looks. So yeah, you can see like, you can see my keyframes. You can see that it's just like, donk, donk, donk. Um, and what I did to make that feel more natural is I added a track modifier. So when you add a track modifier and set it to spring, it's kind of like After Effects inertia. So um, instead of it just hitting those keyframes, it's actually jumping and, and sort of like settling into that, kind of like how Liquid does. So you can see it there um, as it comes up. It's, it's sort of like bouncing back and, and doing its thing when I turn it on, um, which is there. There we go. That's better. Um, so yeah, it's already looking like it was quite extreme, actually. I might just drop down the, uh, the strength of it a little bit. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like the basics of what I did. But also when liquids um, kind of like gets disturbed, you get all those lovely ripples and things, which I obviously wouldn't be able to make without it being dynamic. So again, manually, what I did was I added a displacer. So what I've done is I keyframed a displacer to be a zero height um, at the start, and then as it gets into that kind of like movement, I've, I've increased the height, and then I've keyframed it back down again as it settles back down into place, and it creates like, you know, sort of, it's not perfect, but it was a dirty way of achieving something that, um, yeah, like, that's kind of like how I did it. So, um, so that, yeah, that's how I made sort of fake liquid, I guess. Um, and I don't think I have time to show you my other project, unfortunately. So um, let me just go down to here. Um, if you want to learn anything um, at all about cinema, these are the people that I recommend. They're absolutely incredible. They know way more than I do. And I've obviously mentioned Rocket Lasso a lot. That's the last project that I was um, talking about. And if you want to know any more about me, um, you can find me at Ploy Motion pretty much anywhere. Um, but yeah, that's my project and presentation. So give me a shout if you have any questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ploy. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> you nervous? Yeah. Oh, you shouldn't be. Wasn't it amazing? <laughs> uh, there you go, see? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you again. and. Um, We'll see you soon. Yeah, definitely. Please ask any questions that you have. She'll be around here. And um, we'll see you back in 15 minutes with Sensu next. Thank you. Thanks.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the note editor, even better redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh. Or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new note editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, new nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. All through this year, we've been regularly releasing new sets of capsules. Maxon's collection of tailor-made materials, models, and nodal assets to help you kickstart your projects, including plant assets by Laubwerk, home decor models by Pavel Zoch, and redshift materials by Fuchs and Vogel that are perfect for architectural visualization, product shots, and motion graphics. There's also a new brake spline modifier by Rocket Lasso, which allows you to evenly or randomly subdivide splines with spacing, great for creating dynamic stacks with objects swept along curves. Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to easily use 3D tracking data to accurately place flares in a scene, or direct your flare with a parallel light or spotlight cone angle. You can also now control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. 
Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great for those classic 1970s and 80s movie looks. And in what is sure to be a favorite, schmutz can now be illuminated by the background, or your flare, or both. To help you work more efficiently in Real Lens Flares, we've also added a draft mode. Simply enable draft mode on your After Effects layer, and the render quality will be reduced by a factor of 4 to increase performance. When you go to render, draft mode is automatically ignored, and your flare is rendered at full quality. And remember that Real Lens Flares and many of these new features are also now available in Adobe Premiere Pro. Universe has hundreds of presets to help you get started, and this release adds over 50 new presets to inspire your creativity and give your designs and edits a head start. Magic Bullet Looks also adds dozens of new presets to give you even more options for professional creative color grades. Also, the OCIO configuration in your After Effects project is now seen and synchronized with Magic Bullet Looks, so you don't have to worry about getting consistent color throughout your pipeline. Trapcode Particular has hot new features, introducing Combustion, a new fluid dynamics option to create fiery looks with particular particles. Control attributes like temperature over life as particles ignite and then turn to smoke. If you've ever created particle trails from a parent and had to increase the particle account significantly in order to create a line, now with the new stroke from parent feature, those lines are created for you automatically. Create particle trails and tails fast and easy and at perfect quality while still having control over essential attributes such as size, color, and opacity over life.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the node editor, even better redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system this means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh. Or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new node editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your... Welcome back guys and hello to everyone watching live. We are back now again with Sensu. That is a creative agency out of Holland. Um, they are creating mostly biotech, medical and clean energy animations. And we have Thomas and Yerun who will be talking about beauty of neuroscience and from 3D to 4D, how Maxon Cinema 4D um, improved the workflows. All yours. Thank you very much. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> that's, that's intense. Um, good afternoon. We're uh, Jeroen, I'm Thomas. We're from Senzu, as uh, Karan uh, just told. And for the next 45 minutes, oh, the, uh, the screen isn't working. Showing the different parts. OK, that's annoying. All right, we just oh. have to wing it. Okay. Good to know. Thanks. And yeah, uh, we're going to talk quickly about uh, who we are, what we're doing uh, at work, and then Drew going to do uh, his first part of the presentation, and the second part is going to be my, uh, gonna be my presentations. But we're going to start off with a quick show reel of our work and what we kind of do at Senzu. And uh, sound isn't working. No sound. And oh, now it is. Okay. Terrible internet. Thank you. So we're a creative uh, uh, agency for biotech, medical, and clean energy. And we basically produce 3D animations, film, interactive websites, and stand-up brand identities for companies 
uh, that are in the industry with the, you know, the biotech and medical uh, uh, industry. And we basically combine and mix everything that's actually possible. So we combine film with animation, we combine uh, the websites with animation, and make everything a whole cohesive story and color and look and uh, feeling. We have uh, different departments uh, throughout the entire team, and uh, we have basically we have producers, we have planners, uh, uh, we have project managers who manage different kind of projects. Uh, we have four uh, animators actually working right now at Senzu. We have uh, our, our, uh, website people who actually not develop all the websites for us. We have uh, a composer actually who during his daytime actually makes hardcore music, but. During for us, he actually makes very beautiful music, similar in the like in the showreel. So we got a whole mix of different kind of people uh, uh, working together with us. And the way we work as an artist is like we got four different artists, and we all do basically different projects all together or individually. So we do our project basically from start to finish all on our own. So we start with the storyboard, uh, we create our own look and uh, look feel. Uh, the camera animation, how everything looks until the editing and the final uh, uh, um, final film. And the interesting about it is that we all have completely different backgrounds. Like we got people from product design, we got people who actually are uh, character animators, we got people who actually were way more into illustration, we got people actually from more uh, animated TV shows, and the result is all very interesting and very creative uh, to see. As you can see, this is our uh, basically a couple of examples of uh, the four uh, artists that actually work here at Senzu. As you can see, some we, yeah, we all do it in our own uh, unique way. So we some like actually to go a little bit more realistic, like the illustrator uh, um, background, who actually likes the more uh, simplified, simplistic style, have a little bit more color and you know, shaping like that. So, and it's interesting to see as an artist as well, like how other people are doing and see like well. This is totally not how I would do it, but it's so amazing to see how someone else actually does it. And to motivi motivate this actually, uh, since we started uh, with some uh, internal projects called, that we internally call Sensor Labs, but uh, it's now called the Human Blueprint. And it's uh, four different um, episodes uh, talking about how the body basically works. And the challenge for us was uh, to make an episode in a completely different style and also challenge ourselves to do something we haven't done before. So the video you are going to see is all de developed in cinema. Embark on an eclectic journey to uncover the wonders of the human blueprint. From its intricate infrastructure to each tiny particle, our body is a marvel of engineering. Dip into this series of 3D animated shorts and lose yourself in the universe of interconnected systems and functions that shape who we are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Jeroen. He's going to talk about the beauty of neuroscience. And afterwards, I'm going to talk about my experience on uh, starting to work in Cinema 4D after working many, many years in 3D as Max. So, Jeroen, place is all yours. Thank you very much. So, I'm going to be talking about the creative process of the beauty of neuroscience. And it's a project for SciSci and for the people who don't have a medical degree like I do. I'm going to explain it real quickly. It's about they create certain antibodies that bind within your receptors in your neurons. So you have the brain neurons receptors, so it's very small. And with those antibodies, they're able to see which sicknesses within the brain you have. But I can talk the whole day about the complicated science. I can just also show you the project. Can you help me? The brain is one of the most extraordinary and complicated structures in the universe. It consists of many different cell types, together forming an intricate network. At Synaptic Systems, we engineer highly specific antibodies for neuroscience. 
Nice. Ik denk dat we het lokaal echt moeten laten zien. Of neuroscience. Oh. However, there are moments when this beautiful structure loses its means of protection, due, for instance, to a leak in the blood-brain barrier. As the system in the brain is compromised, neurons start to get extremely stressed, resulting in inflammatory responses such as microglia activation and immune cell infiltration. To visualize these complex immune responses, we have extended our portfolio with the addition of SciSci Histosure. You can now answer all your scientific questions through the use of our highly characterized antibodies for neuroscience, immunology, and cancer research. Developed in Göttingen for the benefit of the worldwide scientific community. So that's the animation. And I'm going to talk uh, about how I came to the creative processes for the look and feel, as well uh, about the histological feel, which I will talk about a little bit later. So because it's science, it's always quite complicated stuff we have to animate. So the first thing that we have to do is understand the science. And that really helps by sitting with the script writer as well as with the client so we can form a good triangle of communication and everybody understands what people have to do and then the script writer writes the script and the artist goes over to the storyboarding so that's for me my part and then because it's very scientific it's also very nice to have a lot of references so you know how it works in the real world so with creating the story, the script writer writes the script um, and fuses this, the art with the science. Then for me, it's, uh, f what I do is create a storyboard that's mostly descriptive and very objective. That makes me leave a lo lot of space for more creativity for myself later in the animation pro process. And once I know what I'm gonna uh, animate, I'll find all the necessary hero assets so I know I have the right molecules and I know I have the right systems. So as you can see, I needed a mouse brain, I needed some neurons, um, the blood-brain barrier and some other stuff. So I just have a general idea what kind of components are going to be in the animation. So once I kind of understand the science and I have the models and everything, it's time for the more fun and creative part at my end, at least. <laughs> I can start looking for inspiration, I can create some mood boards, and I can f see which colors and emotions I want to provoke within the animation. So that's really my time to shine then. So I created a mood board, and I found a couple of elements within the mood board very pleasing for my eyes. Uh, if you look to the right, you can see the kind of tulip that's, full, that's fully bl blue, which I really like how calming it looks, and it gives a lot of satisfaction and a lot of peacefulness. But the middle image at the top, you can see the yellow uh, and orange uh, sparking through the neurons, which I like because it's a bit more magical and playful and I also liked uh, how the brain is looking on the left side, which is a bit more abstract, uh, which I also tried a different uh, techniques for. So just by creating a simple mood board, I can create some inspiration and start combining some things to try to create some new art. So then it goes to like actually working on it. <laughs> so. There are a couple of challenges, uh, for example, some design solutions like how are we going to show the complicated brain? There are a lot of different ways to visualize something like that. Also, which colors will vibe the best with each other and have the best emotions for the movie? And once I know all that, I can apply it to all the basic scenes I made so I can see an overall view of how the animation is going to look like. So. Here you have a little process of my designing for the brain. As you can see in the inspiration for the mood board, I started off with a bit more of an abstract brain uh, with a lot of colors and then a lot of particles. I tried to make it quite magical. The only thing is it becomes 
so condensed with so many, much information, you can't really see anymore what is what and which part of the brain is what part. So it was a nice try, but I ended up not succeeding with it. So I thought maybe take a little step back, but still try to have like the sparkles inside the brain, as you can see on the opacity layers, but try different colors so you can still see the different sections of the brain. But yet again, if you look more inside the center of the brain, it becomes very cluttered again. So again, I failed. It's a lot of trial and error. And here I try to do it with uh, more particles as well, so sparkles, but try to make one piece opaque and the rest with a lot of opacity. So your focus is really at one place. But yet again, I didn't still didn't like how the opacity layers started to overlap on each other. It became quite messy, in my opinion, again. So we, we, I brought it back to the basics. <laughs> so I just made one opaque uh, brain and then highlight uh, a part of a brain. You can feel, you can see it's quite a simple solution, but sometimes you just need to try and experiment different stuff to see what works the best in the end. So when I um, tried to tackle this animation, I created one scene and I created a lot of different colors to see which parts I liked from it. Also taking inspiration from the mood board. And you can see on the top here, there is there you can see more the inspiration for the calm colors. Uh, I really liked how that made me feel calm and it's, it's more mystical as well. But if you look at the right top side, you can see there are more brighter colors and it's a bit more lively and vivid. So while making the, the different styles, I ended up combining them all by using the blue, the dark blue, to show more the calmness within it and match it with the yellow, which is a bit more playful and magical, so you have nice contrasting colors. And as you can see, I have here a bigger image for you with the color palette on the next side. Uh, it's a good way to test as well if the colors are matching. And as I told once, I was like, okay, this is going somewhere. I applied the colors to all the example scenes and I made a mood board from it just to see if the scenes look a bit alike and if the look and feel is cohesive in the animation. And, and if I can judge it myself, it worked out quite well. So that part is done and I can start animating it. And actually, the materials is super simple. I love using Maxon noises. And my colleague likes to use texture, so there's an artist difference, to be honest. But I love using the Maxon noises because they're uh, procedural. You can use a lot of different noises, and you can stack noises on top of each other. But I just used a blue Maxon noise into a subsurface scattering. I used another Maxon noise into the bump map and so a little bit of displacement. So there's no rocket science going on with the textures. Same goes for the background materials, only I blended it with a yellow material and I animated it again using the Maxon noise. So if you have something in the background, you can see almost like it's sparkling and with the depth of field, it looks even more magical. So that's a cool and simple trick that really worked. And for the lighting, you can see the camera on the top. Uh, I used a lot of light coming from the back. Uh, the reason why I use that is because if you have the light coming from the back, it really works well on the subsurface scattering. So I, I, I was able to create a fairly basic material, but I could create a lot of detail by adding uh, a harsh light from the back, so the lighting is doing most of the detail. I also used a very low spread, so there's a lot of contrast between what I want lit and what I want dark. So it's a bit more playful and magical. And here you can see, if it's loading, the process of an example scene.
op lokaal pakken. Oh, fuck. Yeah, just so simple lighting and then later adding a little bit of color correction. I'm not a color genius like Max on, but it did its job. So then on to uh, a little bit more of a technical part is was creating the histological view. So a histological view is basically a scan of a brain and you can have a lot of slices within the brain and the scan can go through all the slices so you can see all the different parts of the brain and then as you can see in the reference image uh, you get like a carpaccio of the brain. And I wanted to recreate this as realistically as possible. And the way I could do that was using the Voronoi, the fields, and a little bit of X particles. So I started off with downloading a mouse brain. <laughs> Just a simple mesh. I created a matrix uh, with a linear cloning. So I have a lot of point data. And using that point data, I can drive it in a source for the Voronoi fracture, uh, adding the mouse mesh into the Voronoi fracture. Using the point data, as you can see, I can create a lot of small slices of the brain. So now, now I have the information technically, but now I want to make it pretty and make it presentable. So I create one mesh out of it for just optimization purposes. So using that mesh, I created a X particle emitter and emitted it on top of the mesh. And I emitted all the particles only in the Y axis because the camera is going from Z. So if the particles go that way, you don't have the slices anymore. It gets a bit blurry. And then I added a little bit of variation, a little bit of turbulence, just to add a little bit of detail. And then using the fields, I was able to create the killing and the spawning of the particles. And I created the camera and put the fields as a child of the camera. So wherever the camera goes in the Z depth, some particles would spawn and some particles would not spawn. And exactly at the focal point of the camera, most of the particles are seen. So it's a very simple but cool setup in my opinion to show this. And then you have the end result. So that's how I created the histological view using Cinema 4D. And now we're off to my colleague's presentation. If you have any questions, please wait until uh, the end of the presentation and we're also at the demo panel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. OK, uh, I got a quick question. How many of you are actually Cinema users? Quite a bunch, perfect. How many of you have some knowledge of 3ds Max? Basically none. <laughs> we got one. Who's uh? Okay, now I know. Now I kind of know the level that I need to talk to. Perfect. So, I've been using. I'm in the industry already for nine uh, years now, and most of the time I've used 3ds Max and V-Ray for my tools. I also used uh, Blackmagic Fusion for compositing for pretty much every project I uh, work on, but and I'll, we'll, we'll discuss that later. And I now work at Senzu now for four years, and when I started working at Senzu, I was the only animator uh, there. So it was basically asking me, well, what software do you want to work on? Well, Max, because that's why they work, duh. And that worked out pretty fine. And then another artist worked on, uh, joined us, and he was fantastic. What, is he, what does he use? Cinema. Well, he does great work in cinema. Let him work in cinema. Fine. That's perfect. We started growing more. Another artist showed up. Well, what do you want to use? Well, we want to use cinema. Perfect. That's great. He shows up. Well, what do you want to use? Well, cinema. That's perfect. Let's Overtaking go. Overtaking the company with cinema. <laughs> so eventually we came to the point that it became a problem. I mean, if I got sick, no one could do my job. And if they got sick... I couldn't do their job. So the issue became now, obviously, obviously it became uh, to the point that, yeah, 
I had to switch to cinema. Great. Now I had to find the equivalent of everything I knew for the past you know, years and you know, find it in cinema. Also do it in a couple of months because I do have to work on projects, you know, uh, uh, finishing everything off. And you now, since there are not many that, ooh, uh, uh, Max users are going to make it a little bit more uh, simple. Uh, the difference that I had to find out were like, f uh, were, they were quite different. I knew we are going to use uh, Redshift instead of V-Ray. And between Redshift and V-Ray, there is not much difference you now if you uh, start using it. I mean, the same kind of shading is in the same thing. You use area lights in both things. So you can easily you now uh, take both uh, renders uh, with ease. But you know, for Max, it's the easiest way to use basically to make anything is the modifier tab, which you know, for you know, anyone, basically everyone here who doesn't you, uh, know it, it's basically if you have an object, you can basically stack every thing you want to adjust on your object uh, above each other, which is super helpful. It's kind of like playing with Legos. And no, and that's basically everything's per object base. And Cinema doesn't have anything uh, remotely like it. So itself, it has you know, the objects window where you can you know, adjust everything. So there was a huge uh, uh, difference for me. But it was also kind of freeing because now instead of you know, really having everything in object based, it was all world. Everything was in the world. And Basically, it allows you to you know, experiment, experiment a little bit with, you know, instead of just one object, use the entire scene and you know, playing around with that. And you know, feeling like you know, playing with Legos, the objects window is exactly like that. You know, putting everything under a null, having you know, this as a giant Lego object, and you can copy and everything and use that uh, uh, for, for your film. Worked out great. Layers is also another thing that's completely different. Max has layers, basically layers to you know, Stack everything, and you, know, you can just turn it off, uh, on, you know, freeze ev everything so you can't click on it. But cinema ha basically has no, we can do a lot more. It can basically, you can turn it off, you can turn it on. And even if, like me, if you're a huge, uh, huge compositor, it's perfect because you, know, you can turn it off you know, for different kind of uh, render layers if you want to use. So I thought, well, well, this is great. This makes my life a whole lot easier. And, well, no. I, I, I'm not a big texture fan because uh, it, it's just very time consuming. Uh, so stuff like triplanar mapping is thankfully it's basically everywhere these days. So it makes my job a whole lot easier. You can use just triplanar mapping and everything. No, it's for simple textures. It already looks fantastic. It makes me uh, it's so much easier. But something like I used a lot like the V-ray distance texture, it's not there. And for those who don't know, V-Ray distance texture is basically a uh, black and white texture from no, between object A to object B. It's basically, well, what's the dis distance between those two? Well, cinema has fields. It makes it so much easier. You got fields. You can put an object in there and say, well, this is the distance between there. Well, great. I can do that as well. Well, now Max calls it fall off. Cinema calls it fresh null, if I you know, say it correctly. And well, particles, scattering, well, Cloner does pretty much 90% of all that stuff, so that's perfect. Making organic shapes like cells, you know, making them uh, 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 multiply them, well, volume measure does pretty much everything for you. And you know, since those things are already uh, uh, on the right side of your menu, the first thing you're going to do is open and see what's going what's gonna to happen. And I'm a big fan of you know, making uh, stuff real, which is making you know, everything you know, full with mistakes, even your camera movement, you know, keeping your hand held. Just adding a fiber attack on a fiber attack on everything makes it just you know move around, makes my life so much easier. I mean, yeah, uh, um, 3ds Max has it as well, but just putting a tag on everything makes it so so easy. So, for the to show you on how I um, made this progress, I'm gonna show you a quick click of uh, a quick clip of um, animation I just uh, finished. It's called for tidal vision. It's basically about a molecule that's in uh, that's going to be used to uh, clean out uh, all the pollution out of water and you know, clean out you know, plants of uh, uh, fungi and insects. Let's go.
As you can see, the film gave me a lot of challenges. Not only I had to match uh, all my animations with the filmed footage that uh, was going to be uh, used, but no. I also had to make a molecule look uh, a little bit more you know, real and still feel like a molecule. But also you know, I had to make some uh, different kinds of pollutants. I had to make uh, a membrane where it could you know, attach to. So it had, this project gave me all kinds of challenges. challenges. Um, so the first thing is you know, making the molecule. Um, lots of times when we get a client, uh, they can deliver us all kinds of different models of molecules, of proteins. And lots of times those models aren't really that nice for a geometry. They're full with a geometry. You can't really unwrap it. Well, you can. You know, you're going to take a week to make it a little bit nice. And, s and if the uh, client says, well, we don't like it, well, that's a week gone. You can't do that. So that's why I like to work procedurally. Again, I like to work with Legos. Just you know, make different kinds of pieces of uh, textures and you know, stack them all together. If the client doesn't like it, well, I can just turn it off. Easy. So. Um, what Cinema in really improved for my workflow for this is, again, fields, just instead of you know, the few ray distance texture, just um, since we're working with procedural uh, generated models anyway, I can use those to uh, generate, uh, generate maps for this. And also, during this project, uh, Redshift came with the new jitter node, which I immediately could use for all the pollutants in the water. So this is the model that the client actually delivered to us for the molecule. And it's not that interesting to look. It's just, no, it's balls and sticks. And it's, it's scientifically accurate because, you know, that's what molecules are, balls and sticks. So the first thing I have to do is you know, make it look a little bit more organic. And because uh, the molecule is actually in water, I have to make it a little bit uh, uh, feel like, like uh, coral was the thing that we were, gonna, uh, we were going for. So use the volume measure to make it a little bit more organic. But the thing is, the client was like, well, all those tiny balls that you actually see, they serve a purpose because one part of those balls are actually attracting all the pollutants towards the uh, molecule. The molecule is called the chitosan. And when those, all those pollutants are actually attracted to the molecule, it just goes to, uh, it falls down to the surface and you can just scratch it up and your water is clean. It's perfect. So I still had to keep all those uh, balls still intact and use those uh, in the animation. So what I used uh, as well is used um, uh, vertex map basically in fields uh, to create a map. So I could you know, see you know, what are the balls, what are the sticks, and you know, use some color variation in my eventually in my texture for this. So showing the generated um, shape with the ma uh, balls uh, beneath that. I created a very simple vertex stack. And as you can see here, you can basically have, uh, uh, can change the value of how far you want to make the map lo look. You can make it a little bit more uh, overall or make it really sharp. And for me, the most important part was basically differenti differentiate basically the sticks for this. But since the balls were still a really important part of the, uh, of the film, I kept the balls instead of the sticks because I could just invert the fields for this and uh, not have double geometry, which is no, n unnecessary. So this is the map I actually used uh, them for in my texture. So starting off with the uh, base for the texture, I used the dust uh, um, deposit te texture for all kinds of scratches, the splodges, and uh, dust basically, and just putting it down there. No, it doesn't really look that well. Just Using triplanar mapping, maps it all around, blurs all the edges around, and the mapping looks great. I used I used ramp throughout uh, uh, for the color as well. You now everything that's black is going to be more brownish. Everything white is going to be you know, more beige. I'm having it a bit more organic uh, feeling for it. I used the Fresnel uh, texture on top of that as well, just to get a little bit more shape duration uh, in my texture. As you can see here, then I added the fields uh, mask as well, just to get the uh, all the sticks a different color for this. Used an overlay for this just to uh, have the same color uh, range as the base texture beneath that. And this is then the final texture of the chitosan. With my overall shading, you can see that I used uh, uh, dust for this, the triplanar mapping, the ramp, 
Fresnel and also the sp I use the sponge texture basically for uh, have giving a coral look because now it has all these different kinds of holes in there and just gives the same feeling for it. For uh, the membrane, I kind of did the same thing. I first started with uh, basically a little digit like this, which I sculpted in Blender. Yes, I use Blender for sculpting because I don't sculpt that much because of my way of working with you now a procedural way, but I wanted to try it out for this. And But yeah, I also know ZBrush, so don't worry. I started with a basic color for uh, the digit for this. Again, use the dust deposit uh, to give it a little bit of color variation on top of it. I used the planner UV just to get a uh, uh, color difference of light difference between the top and the bottom. And I used... Uh, um, I used basically the sculpt uh, um, uh, details from there also in the texture just to get a little bit more, a little more detail back that I already sculpted because you know, I used a lot of subsurface scattering for this because just using it makes everything look organic, which is just the fantastic cheat that there is. And this is then the final result for one of those digits. Before I'm going to explain how I made the membrane for this, I'm quickly going to explain that Indeed, Jitter came when right when I was in production of uh, this film. So I could immediately start using it for all the pollutants here in the water. Because they attract like stuff like uh, plastic pieces in there. It was so easy to just you know, have different kinds of plastics to, to look uh, to see with you know, the same kind of shape. So I had the base uh, color of red and just you know, changed the variation of hue, lightness, and it already made the picture already feel way richer. So starting with the um, membrane simulation for this, I had to figure out, OK, I have to make a giant membrane of the plants. Uh, how do I do this? Well, thankfully, Cinema has this nice little button called Cloner. You can just clone everything. And uh, it's, it's kind of like particles. Just scatter it all around and you know, make it look nice. The same thing I did here for uh, a membrane as well. And how Cinema you know, improved my workflow for that is indeed, it's so easy. The thing is, I learned afterwards, like stuff like uh, using a matrix instead of a cloner just made the viewport uh, uh, way faster. That's something I learned from a different colleague who uses a uh, matrix for pretty much for everything and just you know, use the redshift tag uh, to say, well, this is the geometry you want to use and you know, makes the viewports you know, way faster. That's what I'm actually using now for the, my current project I'm working on. So creating the membrane, started with the digit I sculpted and uh, playing with some uh, displacement and noise just to make it wave around, the, no, make the na uh, movement feel natural. So I scattered everything uh, over the plane, rotated the uh, axis of the uh, digit, and I used the push apart to make sure that everything is a little bit now uh, evenly spread it. Also used the random to uh, change the uh, orientations of all the digits. And there you go. Everything is moving around because of the displacement. You have a very natural looking membrane. Then we come to the fun, uh, final part of uh, um, uh, my workflow, which is compositing. And I use compositing pretty much for everything. I don't use uh, uh, the depth of field and redshift and stuff. I do the everything in post. And for me, that was one of the important things in cinema, like, OK, how much can I take from uh, compositing for this as well? Answer, a lot. Because I use a lot of, uh, I work different uh, ways of compositing depending on the project. Usually it's just you know, making a, a beauty AUV of all, all the passes. You know, get your uh, diffuse, your lighting, your uh, global illumination. Your reflections, and after that, you know, you can uh, you can adjust everything, add depth of field, add motion blur, add some glow, and stuff like that. But sometimes I actually like to uh, uh, change the lighting as well. Like some stuff, like we have a mitochondria which emits lights. But what if I want to make it to flicker? Uh, I'm the kind of the lazy person who was basically like, well, let's fix everything in post. Just generate everything in cinema, no, render it out, and just no, make it nice in uh, fusion. Same thing goes for flickering. You can just add the flicker in post. If the client doesn't like it, well, I don't have to re-render. Just turn the node off, and it's done. That's why I work everything in post. It's just 
I, do, I like to save uh, time on rendering. You know, if, if the client doesn't like the color, well, just fix it in post. Now it's done. Don't have to re-render. And Cinema for me is actually really helpful for this because it has this thing called takes. And uh, like I know Max uh, has some couple, I have some stuff for this, and it has some plugins that actually does the job as well. But Cinema actually has takes and does the job already for me. And it was so helpful for this because I had to show basically inside of the molecule, you know, which is attracting all the pollutants, and I also had to show the outside, you know, how the mo molecule actually looks like. So I had to add already two layers for this as well. And at one point in the beginning of the animation, we also had to ha see this entire field of all these molecules. So I had to make another tag of you know, a layer of uh, molecules, which so showed everything. So I had already had three tags of uh, takes of everything. And the Redshift tag is super helpful for this, because you know, it allows you to really make some masks for uh, everything. And, no, and that's what I'm going to show you now. We have basically the simple um, uh, molecule in the water. And you have an alpha channel of uh, your simple geometry. Then you have the inside, basically, of uh, what's attracting all the pollutants. So blue is actually uh, attracting everything, and red is basically negative force. And I used basically two different materials on the, uh, uh, for the geometry. One is just regular subsurface scattering, and I used a glass material just to refract the light that's actually inwards from all the balls. Let's show this one more time. It wants to. There you go. So what I did for also all the pollutants that are actually floating around in uh, all the wa in the water, I added a redshift tag basically on uh, the null that actually uh, holds all the pollutants together. Make it a mat of it so that you know if I have my second um, uh, take basically, I just have an alpha channel that's only showing all the uh, all the balls on the inside and not you know showing the uh, pollutants on the alpha channel as well. So I have you no know, full control of every specific part in uh, my composite. And to show you all the passes that I render out, it's basically the, uh, everything is you see here. You have got the fog, you've got the reflections, and everything's, everything's stacked together. It's subsurface, it's depth of field, it's the fog adding to it, it's the glow that I use as two different layers. Added some particles, I use the glow also as a, a magnetic force that's actually attracting all the pollutants. And um, I think I have to replay this because it's going quite fast. Oh, Jesus. It doesn't want to. Nope. Hang on. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so we created the magnetic force as well for uh, um, that attracts all the pollutants because that was really very important for the clients. And after that, I added uh, just a little glow. I added lens uh, uh, characteristics like distortions, chromatic aberration, a uh, little bit of glow, a little bit of vignettes, and then a final grade uh, to mix everything together with the final uh, film. And just to show you uh, the end result as well, here's the final film uh, as well. So you can see how it mixes, maxes, uh, mixes, sorry, matches everything with the live action footage as well. Because some shots actually had to match with uh, live action as well. In the them. wondrous realm of nature, something extraordinary yet unseen exists all around us. One of our world's most abundant building blocks a natural biopolymer found throughout Earth's domains, from the deepest oceans and densest forest to your own backyard. Meet Kaidison, a silent hero brimming with the potential to revolutionize entire industries. No matter its surroundings, Kaidison displays qualities that make it utterly unique among molecules. To begin with, biodegradability. It is easily broken down by enzymes so common that they too are all around us. 
Another thing setting Kaidasen apart is its positive electrostatic charge. This natural positive charge is extremely useful and can, for example, be used to remove pollutants from contaminated water. Kaidasen attracts and binds to negatively charged particles in the water, including a range of inorganic and organic contaminants, effectively trapping them. Kaidasen's degradability also creates the downstream potential to reuse any leftover solids. This leaves us with a truly remarkable solution for safeguarding our most precious resource. But the marvels of Kaidasen extend far beyond water. Thanks to its third unique feature, its function as an elicitor, our hero also enjoys a special connection with the plant world. When applied anywhere on a plant, Kaidasen causes a cascade of desirable reactions, inducing the plant's resilience while increasing its nutrient uptake and accelerating growth. Upon first contact with a specific cell wall receptor, the plant is in effect tricked into believing it's under attack. As one of the core components that all fungi and insects are built up of, it's no wonder Kaidasen triggers plants to shore up their defenses so vehemently. Building upon this instinctive response, we can gain access to a whole range of more effective crop protection and plant nutrition products. From the future of agriculture and water treatment to the progression of material science, Kaidasen opens up a world of possibilities and has the capacity to make a real impact across the globe. At Tidal Vision, we're fully committed to the continuous evolution of Kaidas and science. Join us as we unlock the boundless potential of this remarkable biomolecule, harnessing the power of nature for her own preservation. So that was our presentation for today. Do you have any questions for us? Okay, then if you have any questions later, we're here at the demo booth, so you can talk to us about the project, and we can show some project files as well if you're even more interested. And thank you very much for listening, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Jeroen and Thomas. It was a pleasure to see what the tools can do and such a unique industry that you both work in. Uh, we also have the founder of Sensu here, Kaspar. I know I'm putting him on the spot, but I've been talking to him and he is a brain behind everything. So it's amazing to have you here as well, Kaspar. And I'm pretty sure that team is watching online as well. Abs absolutely, you're getting a raise. Ask for it. <laughs> but, um, it was fun and hope you all enjoyed it. Please ask any questions that you have. It's a unique field. Um, they use the tools in a unique way. So thank you. Thank you. We'll see you in 15 minutes with Simona next.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the node editor, even better redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, cloth, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh. Or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new node editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, new nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. All through this year, we've been regularly releasing new sets of capsules. Maxon's collection of tailor-made materials, models, and nodal assets to help you kickstart your projects, including plant assets by Laubwerk, home decor models by Pavel Zoch, and redshift materials by Fuchs and Vogel that are perfect for architectural visualization, product shots, and motion graphics. There's also a new break spline modifier by Rocket Lasso, which allows you to evenly or randomly subdivide splines with spacing, great for creating dynamic stacks with objects swept along curves. Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to easily use 3D tracking data to accurately place flares in a scene, or direct your flare with a parallel light or spotlight cone angle. You can also now control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. 
Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great for those classic 1970s and 80s movie looks. And in what is sure to be a favorite, schmutz can now be illuminated by the background, or your flare, or both. To help you work more efficiently in Real Lens Flares, we've also added a draft mode. Simply enable draft mode on your After Effects layer, and the render quality will be reduced by a factor of 4 to increase performance. When you go to render, draft mode is automatically ignored, and your flare is rendered at full quality. And remember that Real Lens Flares and many of these new features are also now available in Adobe Premiere Pro. Universe has hundreds of presets to help you get started, and this release adds over 50 new presets to inspire your creativity and give your designs and edits a head start. Magic Bullet Looks also adds dozens of new presets to give you even more options for professional creative color grades. Also, the OCIO configuration in your After Effects project is now seen and synchronized with Magic Bullet Looks, so you don't have to worry about getting consistent color throughout your pipeline. Trapcode Particular has hot new features, Introducing Combustion, a new fluid dynamics option to create fiery looks with particular particles. Control attributes like temperature over life as particles ignite and then turn to smoke. If you've ever created particle trails from a parent and had to increase the particle account significantly in order to create a line, now with the new Stroke from Parent feature, those lines are created for you automatically. Create particle trails and tails fast and easy and at perfect quality while still having control over essential attributes such as size, color, and opacity over life. Welcome back. I uh, hope you all are enjoying. We have last two presentations now. Uh, we have Simono, Simona Todorova from Belgium, who is an artist and an illustrator and works in the gaming industry. We'll be talking about creating illustrations using ZBrush. So hello, everyone. Um, a warm welcome to everybody attending my presentation here live, as well as everybody tuning in online. 
Um, I currently work as an artist in the gaming industry, uh, and I have previous experience in the visual effects industry. However, today I will be talking about how I mix 2D with 3D in my personal art style, and how I use ZBrush to create illustrations. In this presentation, I will go over the development of my art style, some style and technique inspirations, as well as my chosen pipeline, and the result and application of my work. The latter part will be demonstrated through the recorded process of the illustration that I have shown here called the Orange Sorceress. So beginning with the development, uh, for me, it all started with drawing. I have been drawing ever since I was little and I could hold a pencil. And the continuous practice and uh, as well as studying of art throughout my life is what led me to pursue art professionally. So I got a bachelor's degree in 3D production and visual effects, and I specialized in stylized character creation. Now, part of 3D character creation is digital sculpting, and this is how I got introduced to the software during my sculpting classes in uni. Honestly, it was love at first sight, so I immediately fell in love with the software, and I have been using it ever since. Now, to me, sculpting in ZBrush while using a digital tablet is the ultimate experience of blending 3D creation with the standard feeling of drawing that you get when you draw on paper. Uh, that's why I love it so much, and I like to practice it in this way. So my earliest work in ZBrush was uh, mainly realistic characters, after which I moved on to creating more stylized characters and assets and developing my style further. I have used ZBrush as well as Cinema 4D and Redshift to design, create, rig, uh, animate, and render characters professionally. And in my experience so far, 2D and 3D art have uh, been two separate things for the most part. So what I mean by this is that typically a final product is either um, predominantly 2D, for example, concept art, a poster, or a recorded video with some effects in it, or predominantly 3D, such as a fully 3D rendered video uh, or stills. There are, of course, exceptions, such as hand-painted textures or 3D effects blended with recorded footage. But for me, in my personal work, I wanted to find a way that not only takes bits and pieces of 2D and 3D and incorporates it into each other, but really visually blends the style of both. Now, before figuring out how to do that, I took a look at how other artists approach creating a blended-looking style. Now, firstly, some style inspirations. So when it comes to uh, types of art that I enjoy consuming as well as producing, there are three main categories. I really love 3D stylized characters and assets, 2D flat color illustrations, and print design. So I love all three, and I want to create a combination of all three. So that means I have to make sure I'm using both 2D and 3D techniques, um, and that the end product can be a standalone product or be convertible to variations of products. So let's take a look at some art inspirations. So one method uh, shown here is with this example of a Luigi concept art created by Alvaro Suazo and a 3D model based on it created by Alexander Mugeno. Now in the art station post, Alexander writes, everything was done in CGI. I just used Photoshop to create the chromatic aberration and bring up the brightness a bit. So um, painting in 2D to uh, the strokes and shapes onto the model directly is one way of creating this blended look style that Alexander has formed. Another method is that of Tyler Pate. So he likes to create orthographic looking artworks and he begins with a sketch. Afterwards, he moves on to creating his base shapes in Adobe Illustrator. And finally, he adds a texture overlay and he paints details over in Photoshop. So I have taken inspiration from both of these techniques, and I have decided to combine aspects of them together with my already existing skills and knowledge to create a pipeline that works well for me. So the pipeline I have created to form an illustration from idea to final product consists of four parts. So firstly, I begin with creating a concept sketch. Then I move on to uh, sculpting my character in ZBrush and coloring it. Then I create a 3D render. And in the end, I, similarly to Tyler Pate, create a texture overlay in, Z, uh, in Photoshop. Now, begin with the concept sketch. Um, when coming up with a concept, the first thing I do is I think of a few keywords, and I try to form the idea around those keywords. So for this particular illustration, the two keywords were orange and a magician. So once I have chosen my words, I go ahead and create a uh, border of references that I use as I'm sketching. 
Um, as a personal preference, I like to do my sketches on a smaller tablet, since I can bring it around. And if I feel inspired, oh, there's something cool. Let me sketch it real quick. Um, so this following video will be uh, created on the smaller tablet. And one thing I'd like to mention here is that creating an illustration from start to finish can take several hours. So I will be showing you sped up uh, recorded videos of the process. So from the references I have gathered, I chose one main image for the pose of the character, and I begin sketching it out. So I start with rough brush strokes to get the general pose and shapes in. Once I've sketched out the body, I continue with designing the face, the hair, and the decorative assets. I look at multiple images from the reference board as I'm sketching, and I pick bits and pieces from them to try and incorporate into the design. So I experiment with the hair, the clothing, the accessories, until I find a combination of shapes that I like. Now, in this particular artwork, since orange is one of the keywords, I try to incorporate the orange into multiple areas of the design. So not only the shape of an orange, but also the colors, which are reflected in the color palette I have chosen. So this character is a sorceress, uh, so I <laughs> decided to add a magic book to emphasize that. Um, so here you will see me adjusting small details to the clothing and just experimenting. Oh, she's a magician. Let me try and add a hat. Mm, it doesn't really work. Let's erase it. So I go ahead and repeat this process until I'm satisfied with the sketch. Um, what I like to do is also to, um, once I have figured out which parts of the clothing I want to do, as you see me doing here, we add a little bag. And once that is done, I like to flip my image horizontally so I can check if there's areas of the design that I would like to improve, such as the face, as you see here. And once it looks good in the mirrored image, I would go ahead and flip it back to its original state. Now, the next step for me is to create a silhouette of my character. Now, this helps me clearly identify the outline and the volume of the character um, to make sure the design is readable in the silhouette, because a good design should be clear and easy to be perceived by the viewer. So here you see I duplicate the braid. I go ahead and form uh, just the general outline. And once I'm done with that, I will use the same silhouette layer to fill in the base colors. So I have chosen a color palette, like I said, which fits with the orange theme. So I go ahead and block out areas of the skin. Then I will also color in the hair, just basic uh, colors, no nothing fancy in terms of shading, since uh, ultimately this sketch is just uh, the idea for the final product. So I will go ahead and uh, block in the parts that have yellow, the orange, the blue, and the green. And once I am satisfied with that, I will go ahead and finish the concept by adding details such as the eyes, the nose, the lips, the nails, and uh, the little shapes that you see inside of the orange. So this is just to give me an idea where to go with the sculpting at the next stage. So go ahead, add some eyebrows, some eyes. At the earrings, nails, a little detail on the book, background shapes, and voila, the sketch is done. The next step is to create my digital sculpture in ZBrush. Uh, the sculpt is done on my laptop using a bigger display tablet. Uh, I'd like to mention in the beginning it will seem like the sculpture goes a bit quicker, but towards the end it's a bit slower. So let's begin. So I like to begin sculpting by using the default character models inside of ZBrush as a base for the pose. So here I have opened the female base character. Uh, and as I'm positioning it, I also like to leave my sketch on top of the screen to reference as I do this. Uh, I start by positioning the model into the pose that I have in my concept. Um, so I do that by masking areas of the body and moving their pivot point around the point I want to rotate, which is usually a joint. So that would be the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist. Um, what I do here is also I separate the head from the body, and I keep them as two separate meshes, because throughout the sculpting process, I can use the zero measure uh, as fits best for each. Uh, the topology of the head, I leave symmetrical, so it's handy to just keep them separate. So here I'm just slightly positioning the head, getting it uh, as a rough base to match the concept. Now, what I'd like to say here is that um, normally in a typical 3D production pipeline, a character is sculpted symmetrically in an A or a T pose. So that's just uh, an easier and faster way to go about it. Um, 
and the purpose is that you can easily rig it and animate it later. But in this case, the final goal is not that. It's an illustration, so I can already position my character in the pose that it needs to be. I don't need to rig it, um, so I go ahead and do that for this sculpt. Now, once I have positioned the body, I proceed to focus on the head. So I'm going to go ahead and add eyes, eyebrows, ears, lips, and eyelids as the main features of the shape. Then I'm going to begin and build up uh, shapes of the face uh, with simple volumes. Um, and I do this because my character was stylized. So blocking out with uh, simpler shapes is the best way for me to create more stylized shapes instead of taking a real face and trying to make it morph into a stylized one. So this way, I just simplify the shapes that I see. Um, so to form these shapes, I start with a sphere. Um, and I sculpt it into the base for the cheeks, the chin, nose, and eyelids. I go ahead and add a neck, uh, and I adjust, uh, adjust the shapes further using the move and smooth brushes predominantly. I also like to use the inflate, the clay, the clay buildup, the damp standard, and the pinch brushes. So here I'm just tweaking uh, little parts to make it look as simple as possible, since that's the style I'm going for. Simple tweaks, a uh, little area, bridge between the nose and the cheeks. And now once I have that, um, I will move on to create the prominent features of the concept. So a main feature here is the hair. So I'm going to start by building the top part of the hair, again, from spheres. I move them around, I inflate them, I shape them into the sketch, and I make it work in 3D. So when I sculpt, I try to think of the biggest, most simplest shapes that I can break down an object into. So I would take a sphere, you know, duplicate it, sculpt it a little bit, use the Z measure as I'm sculpting to restructure the geometry, and then I would repeat the same process again. So if I would uh, stretch the geometry too much, that's a correct moment to use a uh, Z measure. So then here I'm going to go ahead and create a base for the hat. It's just two simple shapes, again, <laughs> from a sphere. Um, so it doesn't need to be too detailed, just the base of it works perfectly fine. I'm going to go ahead and also create a thinner, more sharp line around the edges of the hat, make sure it looks predominantly good from the front, because that's going to be the final result, but also make sure it looks good from the sides as well. And then once I'm satisfied with this base, I will go ahead and work on the orange slices because they're an important part of the design. So for this, I take a sphere and I flatten the sides. Then I create the inside slices with the rounded corners to fit the more cuter style that I'm going for. Um, so in the sketch, you can see that I drew more inner shapes, but in 3D, um, it looked better to have less. So as I sculpt, I also take into account what works better to translate a 2D sketch into 3D, and I make decisions accordingly. So it's not because I've drawn six shapes that I will exactly do six. It's just whatever looks better. Um, so for shapes like this, um, the rim that we have around the orange, I will go ahead and use the polish option under the deformation tab because it polishes everything uniformly. So I would use the smooth brush, but also the generic deformation option. So once I'm done with the slice, uh, one thing to add is a little detail. So you have this very tiny seed, which seems like a detail, but it will be visible in the end. So I go ahead and make sure that I have this seed correctly placed. Now once I'm done with the orange slice, I'm going to go ahead and merge all objects that form it into one so that I can duplicate it and reuse it in an easier way. So for this process, I like to use the polyg polygon fill preview, which highlights my selected objects in a color. So it's just an easier way to make sure I'm selecting the correct objects and merging them together. So you can see me doing that here. And once that's done, I will put my slice to the side and begin duplicating it. So I start by placing it on the head. It's one of the biggest slices that you see. Then I'll go ahead and duplicate it and place it for the earrings. Now, at this point, I'm thinking, OK, there's other places where I can use the orange slice, but the body that I have is just the base reference. So I need to first structure a good stylized body that fits the shape. So I'm going to pause on the oranges and move on to the body. So I will continue here by blocking out the body using spheres again <laughs> um, on top of the base mesh that I positioned in the beginning. So I'm going to block out the upper torso, the arms, the shoulders, the chest, the waist, hips, and top of the legs. So in the end, I will not be able to see the legs, but having that position in place guides me to create the clothing better. So I make sure to have it underneath, even if it's not visible in the end. So here, I'm going ahead and just simply moving the shapes a little bit, uh, predominantly using the move brush again. 
Um, now for the hand that's reaching in the front, that was a bit more complicated, so I just made a base here, which will not be used in the end. Again, it's just a guideline for the final result. So go ahead, and I create some little fingers, position it. And there we go. We have the base for the body. So once I'm happy with this, I'm going to continue to another main shape, which is the braid. Now, braids are rather complicated to, to do, at least visually at first. So to simplify it, I use half a sphere, and I just duplicate it like that. So this just gives me an idea, OK, that's kind of what like, a braid looks like. So then I'm going to go ahead and actually create one shape, which um, shows the structure of the braid. And I will position it on top, as you can see. And I will use the same object to just duplicate and make it seem like the braid is twisting into each other. Now, an important thing to mention here is that most of the spheres I work with are rather lower poly, but I use the dynamic subdivision option to preview them as higher poly while I'm working. So I will turn this preview on when I'm making slight adjustments, and I will turn it off if I'm making really big adjustments. So ultimately, the actual topology of this is lower, but it just seems higher while I'm sculpting. So once I'm done with the braid, I'm going to merge it together and duplicate uh, and position both braids uh, into place according to the concept. Now, since I have the base of the stylized body, I can go ahead and move on to the clothing. I create the base of the scarf and the base of the skirt. So as you can see, when you use the move brush, uh, the topology tends to look a bit jaggedy, but that's OK, because we have the smoothing brushes. So here, um, I'm creating some of the base. So you see me turn on and off the dynamic subdivision preview for the skirt. I'm also creating the belt, because it's a rather larger shape of the design. So it's very tiny tweaks here and there. So I would move something zero mesh, move something zero mesh. And in terms of the setting of the zero mesher, I just you typically select the same option. So it keeps the topology the same, unless I need to reduce it further. Um, so at this point, um, it's time to use a DynaMesh. So I merge all objects that form the upper body into one object, but I also apply the DynaMesh. So that means that the topology merges into one object, so I can go ahead and smooth it better. And then I would use the zero mesher to decrease the geometry. So I do this process for the upper body, and then I go ahead and do it for the face. So here, all those shapes that I had in the beginning blend into one, and I can very easily smooth the areas in between. So you can see this is uh, a rather quicker way to create stylized shapes. So I would smooth out the areas around the nose and then emphasize other parts, such as the lips and the nose. And voila, that's how I would create the face. So just little tweaks here and there. Adjust the eyebrows a little bit. So at this point, I'm going to um, go back to the clothing and work a little bit on the top. I'm adjusting it to fit the shape of the body. So when I move it, you can see there's some creasing. No problem. We'll just use the zero measure. So just move slightly, zero mesh, move slightly, zero mesh. Um, I do the same for the belt. And at this point, uh, I can begin to focus more on details. So what I'm going to go do uh, here is create the little detail we have in the concept over here. And the easiest way to do that is to mask the area where you want that to be, extract the geometry. Again, looks a bit jaggedy, no problem, smooth it out. Uh, so I go ahead and do that. And here we have the detail of the belt. And finally, I can go ahead and add my orange slice to it. I have also added the bag at this point, because it's a rather larger uh, shape, so it's good to have it already in the scene. Um, I go ahead and take a sphere, stretch it all the way up, and then I make sure that the strap wraps nicely around the body. Uh, again, this is going to mess with your topology, but zero measure is there to save the day. So here, normally, of course, this is one strap, but it's easier to just create the front of the strap and then go ahead and duplicate it for the back of it. So you will see me do that right now. I just go ahead, mirror it to the back side, and even though you won't see the back side as much in the end, it's just nice to make it follow the shape for the, <laughs> for the shading. Little tweaks. Uh, making sure the bag looks like it's a bit heavy, floating down. Save your project, very important. <laughs> now, uh, here I'm going to go ahead and add the leaf shape. It's very basic. I didn't want to draw attention to it, so it's just a very simple shape that I go ahead and add there. 
Now moving on to the book. So I form the base of the book again from spheres and I place it in the hand of the character. And then I adjust the fingers slightly so it really looks like the character is holding the book. Um, once I have done that, I'm going to continue to the arm and apply the same dynamesh technique. So all the objects, as you can see here, we have three objects forming the arm. I'm going to merge them together, uh, use dynamesh to merge the topology, and then zero measure to lower it. So here I'm going to go ahead and slightly scope the arm, just make sure it looks more like an arm, <laughs> pretty much, instead of a cylinder. Um, scope a little bit of the elbow, add a bit more volume. And once I have done it for the arm, I will also add the wrist. Again, same thing. Uh, Dynamesh, zero mesh sculpt. Uh, here I will go ahead and adjust the fingers a little bit more. And once I'm happy with that, I will also merge the wrist into the rest of the arm. And that's also visible with the poly preview. So if your object has the same color, usually uh, once you have Dynamesh, that means, okay, you've done a good job. It's one object merged together. So here, I'm going to go ahead and focus a little bit on the fingers. So since I took the arm from the base female mesh, it's more realistic, but I want to simplify it a bit more. So I'm going to inflate the fingers a little bit. Um, go ahead and also emphasize the fact that they're folding, so just flatten them out a little bit. Uh, and just very slight adjustments to, to the style. It doesn't need to be too realistic, because the style can afford for it to not be extreme realistic. So very slight tweaks. Now, I'm doing this process for one of the arms. And like I mentioned earlier, in a typical uh, production pipeline, you can only do one arm, mirror it, the other arm. But in this case, I just enjoy sculpting. So why not do it for both arms? So I'm going to go ahead and focus on the right arm. Uh, again, the same process. I will merge all the shapes together, start sculpting them. At this point, I thought, well, this is 3D. Can't I copy something? Of course, let's just copy the hand. So I go ahead and copy the hand, flip it around and put it in place. Make sure uh, I add a little sphere there to make sure that there's enough uh, geometry for the program to work with for the wrist. I go ahead, merge it all together, and here I do very slight adjustments. So nothing too crazy, nothing um, super you know, stretching the geometry too much, just very slight tweaks. Um, also, to distinguish between the two hands, I go ahead and position the fingers um, a bit with the same technique I mentioned in the end, which is just uh, masking an area and moving that slightly. And once I have done that, I can go ahead and take both arms and merge it with the torso. Same technique. So I merge them together. I use Dynamesh and um, Zero Measure to lower the topology. Because usually with Dynamesh, if you want a smooth result, you have to crank up the settings. But then you end up with a lot of millions of polygons, which you ultimately don't need. Um, so once I have Zero Meshed, I go ahead and tweak the topology a little bit. And I smooth out areas of the body as well to make it look like it's one uh, consistent piece. Now, the next part here is to create the gloves. Um, so I'm using a similar technique. I'm masking the area around the hands where the gloves will be, and I go ahead and I extract that. But as you can see, you get some artifacts in the topology. So I get a, some holes where you have the fingers. So uh, a little trick I like to do there is use the inflate brush. So I just inflate the topology a little bit, zero mesh it again, inflate, zero mesh, and then uh, that way I can end up with a cleaner topology. So here, as you can see, uh, it looks a bit chunky, so I'm going to go ahead and use the H polish brush to flatten the top and make sure there's like a nice line around the fingers. Very slight tweaks again. Again, this is all uh, done using the dynamic subdivision preview on, so that's what makes it look smooth as I'm going about the sculpting. So I have done this for the left glove, uh, and once I'm done with that, I'm going to go ahead and repeat the process for the right. Uh, one thing I wanted to do here is, in the end of the render, I wanted to have a nice outline to make sure that the gloves are visible, uh, but not too big so that they look bigger than the hands. Saving my project. Yes, moving on to the other hand. So again, here you see the little artifacts, but once you have used Dynamesh a couple of times, the topology gets fixed. So I flatten it again, create a nice rim around the fingers, very slight adjustment. So while I'm sculpting, you can also see me rotate from a lot of angles. It's just to make sure that does it look good from this angle, does it look good from that angle. Um, and also, it's easier for the brush to work in that way. So at this point, I have most of my clothing in. So what can I do next is I can proceed to create the nails. So they're a little bit of a detail, but they will be visible in the end. 
So in a similar way, I'm going to mask out the areas where the nails are going to be. I'm going to extract that, which just means it's going to duplicate just that geometry that I've masked. And then I'm going to go ahead and use the Move and the Smooth brush to position them better. So as you can see, they're a little bit uh, too big for the finger. So with very slight adjustments, I make sure they're, uh, they fit the finger nicely, that they're long enough and visible enough. And I go ahead and do that for each finger, also on both hands. An important thing to mention here when doing nails is often when you extract, you're going to have this geometry that pops out of, the bo like out of the original mesh. But in reality, your nails come out of your finger. So you have to make sure to like, push the backside in to make it look not realistic, but more like believable. Now, once I have done that, uh, I'm going to continue with adding the orange slices on top of the book, just, I have on the, uh, just like I have in the concept. So I go ahead and do that. I have one full slice and then two half ones, duplicating them and positioning them. Then I will go ahead and add the same slice to the bag. So I have this little detail going on here. I'm going to use the inner side on the bag. Again, as you can see, it's only four instead of five. Looks good enough. Leave it like that. <laughs> Uh, once I have done that, I'm going to continue with the book. So I take the cover, I duplicate it, and I scale it down a little bit, and voila, we have pages. So I try to reuse as much of the geometry that I have already in the scene. Uh, I'm going to add the little details to the book. And at this point, um, I go back to the face and start adjusting very small parts of the sculpting. So that's more like a touch-up face. I do that for the face, the hair, the skirt. So I tend to zoom in on the face and then zoom out a little bit. Um, and honestly, tweak it until I'm happy with the way that it looks. So another thing I noticed I could do here is uh, flatten the bottom of the skirt. So that's what I'm doing there. And I'm also going to go ahead and use the H polish brush to um, make the straps of the bag thinner. Um, here you have to be careful because with the H polish, you can create a very, very thin looking geometry. But no worries, you can go ahead and inflate it later. So I just make sure it still looks thick enough to be a strap of the bag. So go ahead and do that for both parts. I also flattened the um, shape of the pages a little bit. You can only see the top part, so that's good enough for that. Um, at this point, I <laughs> went back to the nails because I was like, mm, well, when you zoom out, they're not that visible. So I decided to go back into them and just slightly make them longer. Um, it's also a cool trick because when you make female characters, that can emphasize like the pose that they're trying to get. It draws attention, especially if you have a contrast between the skin color and the nail color. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And once I'm happy with this, it's time for a little bit of file organization. So I'm going to look at uh, my file structure, and I'm going to group some objects in folders. And I'm also going to hide objects that are no longer necessary and not part of the sculpt. So at this point, this is where I also prepare my sculpt for painting. So objects that will have the same color, for example, uh, the gloves or the hat and the skirt, I will group them together because that makes the painting process uh, much easier and faster. Now at this point, uh, another thing I do is I'm going to go over each of my objects and turn off the dynamic subdivision just to see how they look like. Because the dynamic subdivision is something that is only applicable while you're in ZBrush. But the moment you export to another software, that will not be applied. So I just make sure that with it off, I have enough topology, usually mid to high poly enough, to be smooth in whatever software I decide to export it to. So I'm just going to go over, uh, turn, turn it off, make sure it looks good, and turn it back on. Um, and of course, as I do this, I also notice, ah, maybe I can tweak this a little bit. Ah, maybe I can tweak that. So that's usually what you see me doing, like, oh, that, maybe I missed a little part. Go back and tweak it a little bit. So yeah, this is the process where you can see I go back, turn the subdivision off. And honestly, this is why keeping your file clean is kind of important. Uh, if you have sphere 35, 36, 37, it's a bit difficult to keep track of it. So for me personally, naming everything the way that it has to be helps me structure it better. Let's see. So um, once I am done with this, the next step is poly painting. So what I like to do is I like to apply the um, ZBrush uh, material, the fast shader is what it's called, to all of the objects because it has more of a flatter look, which ultimately will blend better with my final result. Then I go ahead and apply a base color to all of my shapes, so all the oranges, the blues, 
the yellows the same way that I did the original concept. So as you can see, it's just that, just flat color. And once I'm happy with that, I will zoom in on the face, and I will use the standard brush in the RGB mode. So on the top, you will see that I have the RGB selected. That means it will only paint color and not move any of the topology. So go ahead and add a little bit of blush. I add some color to the lips. I like to add some eyeshadows, paint in the eyes, um, and also add some hue variation to the clothing. So here you will see me add a bit of orange to some of the clothing just to incorporate the colors a bit better. Yeah, for this detail, I chose to paint it in. Now, once I have this, um, what I'm going to do is I need to position the head uh, correctly. So at this point, the head was symmetrical. But I'm going to go ahead and merge all the objects that are part of the head, uh, move it a little bit, uh, and position it slightly tilted. But she looks a little bit unhappy, so let's give her an expression. So here, this is a duplicate mesh. I'm going to go ahead and create a little smile. Um, make her a little bit more lively, create a little bit of an expression. It's nice to have this as a duplicate, just to make sure uh, if you want to go back to your original symmetrical sculpt, you can. <laughs> so I do that. Um, yeah, and at this point, I thought maybe I should scale the head a little bit. So I go ahead and, again, make sure all the objects are merged, and I scale the head a little bit more, just to emphasize it, um, since I thought that that fits the style better. And also at this point, uh, the sculpt is going to be wrapped up. So I look at it as in total, and I think, OK, is there anything I can fix? Is there anything that I can do better? So one thing I noticed is that I can go over the braids and position them slightly better. And that also the color I picked in my original concept is a bit darker than what I have in the sculpt. So I'm going to go ahead and play with the position of the braids a little bit and yeah, just darken the hair color. Go ahead and do that for both. Very slight tweaks. And we have the finished sculpt. So the next step is to create the 3D render. Now, in order to demonstrate the compatibility between the software uh, in the Max and Arsenal, I have chosen uh, Cinema 4D and Redshift to create my render with. So I begin with creating a new Cinema 4D scene. And the first thing I do is, uh, in the file, I go to the render settings and switch from standard to Redshift. And for now, I leave the default settings in. So then I'm going to go ahead and import an OBJ file, which I exported from ZBrush. Now, this OBJ file is, uh, contains all the objects together, so I haven't split anything up. It's just one mesh. Now, as you can see here, when we import it, uh, we see already the colors in. Uh, but that is because this is a default material in um, Cinema. But what I want to do is I want to create a Redshift material, which is compatible with the Redshift renderer. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new standard Redshift material and apply it to the object. <gasps> but what happens? The colors are gone. But I want them visible not only in the viewport, but also in the render. So what I have to do here is I have to open my material editor. And I'm going to add a attribute note, a vertex attribute. So here I'm going to connect the out color of the at vertex attribute note to the color input of the standard material. But as you can see, that gives you a very like, white result. That's not what I want. So the trick here is to go ahead and select this little tag here, which is the vertex color tag. So basically, Polypainting in ZBrush is the same as vertex colors. So when you import an OBJ file into Cinema, you will get this tag, and that contains all the color information. So I'm going to take that tag and drag and drop it into the attribute name, which is a characteristic of the vertex attribute node. And boom, we have the colors. Um, now, once I have done that, I, looked at, uh, I see that my character looks very shiny, and I just want a very flat overall look. So I'm just going to um, increase the roughness to 1 or 0 0.9. Now, the next step is to prepare my viewport for rendering. So I like to split my screen in two. And um, then I go ahead and I add a camera. So here I'm going to zero out the camera position and rotation, and position it slightly in front of my character. Now, the reason I like to split my screen in two is so that on the left side, I can see what my camera sees, and on the right, use that as a uh, navigation port. So at this point, I go back to my render settings. 
And here I'm going to plug in the size of A3, so the size of an uh, A3 paper. That is the aspect ratio I want in the end for my uh, illustration. So um, I make sure to also look at my concept as I do that. Um, now I tweak the camera a little bit, mainly just position, rotation, and the focal length. So honestly, this is just um, if I like the way it looks, that's my main uh, guideline. I didn't want the camera to look too crazy distorted, so this is what I end up in the end with as a result. And I also like to open the render view as I'm doing this to see okay, what in the end it's actually going to look like. Now at this point, it's time to add lighting. So I'm going to go ahead and add one area light to the scene and check in the render how that looks. So I'm only going to play with the position of the light and the intensity. So usually, um, when people create 3D renders of uh, characters or assets, they like to do the three-point setup, which is typical in photography. But in this case, I don't want to have a rim light. So I'm only going to have two lights instead of a three uh, to omit the rim on purpose. So the purpose of the two lighting is one of them is a main light, so it gives the most light to the object, and the other one is a fill light. So you can see me here, I turn them on and off to see what effect they have on my, on my result. And if they're too bright, I will turn down the intensity. Important thing, I do not touch the colors of the light, so I think I have enough color going on in the painting, so I just leave the color of the lighting to white. So go ahead and I play a little bit with the lights. The position of them. A little bit of rotation. Yes, and at this point, I was satisfied with what I have. So now I'm going to go back into my render settings. And this is an important part. I will change the DPI to 300. Now, why do I do this? Well, because I have to think that my final illustration is going to be printed on paper. And the standard in printing is 300 pixels per inch, whereas the standard for digital is 72. So I need to make sure that my render is already good quality enough uh, to print later. So I changed that. Oh, and why do I choose A3? Um, well, ultimately, I print in a smaller format, but it's nice to have a bigger image just to make sure that you can scale it down if you need to. Uh, it's easier to do that than to go the other way around. So now I have all my render settings set up. Then I go to the Redshift uh, tab, and I like to decrease the noise threshold to 0 0.001. And I also like to really crank up those render settings. <laughs> now, the reason I do that is because I'm going to render only one image. So even if it takes half an hour, uh, I can afford to do that. It's not going to be a sequence. It's just one image. So crank that up to 16, and you're ready to render. So now the only thing that's left to do is to hit the Render button, let the program calculate. And with that, my render is complete. Now, in order to create the final look of my illustration, I import the 3D render uh, into Photoshop, and I begin to edit it. So what I like to do is literally paint over. I add some sketchy lines. I also add some hard shadow areas uh, following the shadow that I have already in my 3D render. I also like to um, add the orange shapes that we had in the beginning as just a flat uh, shape in the image. Mm. I also like to do as a final step, I like to add noise to the image. Uh, I do this in Photoshop, not in the render, because then this noise is applied to both the image and the background. Yeah, I also add a background uh, for the purpose of just making it look more complete. And once I'm happy with this, I can go ahead and create some real life uh, products. So what I like to do is I like to create art prints, stickers, and bookmarks. And I actually have brought some to show you here today. So this is a little bit smaller than A5. So we go ahead and can print this. Then we have bookmarks. As you can see, it's a variation of the design. Just copy the oranges a bit further. Voila, you have a bookmark. And make it minimized. And then we have stickers. So in this way, you can have one illustration and have a variety of products to choose from and create. Yeah, 
So with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. This is how I like to combine 2D with 3D and how I incorporate ZBrush into my design process. If you're interested in following my personal work, it will be available on my website, www.monsatelia.com. You can also find me on Instagram under the same tag. And if you're interested in my regular uh, professional work, you can also find me on ArtStation under Simona Todorova. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simona. Did you all enjoy it? <laughs> cool. Were you nervous, Simona? Absolutely, absolutely. But Is it your uh, first presentation? Yes. Well, many more to come. <laughs> yeah? Thank you once again, Simona. Thank you as well. She'll be here for one more hour. If you have any questions, if you want to connect with anyone, please do so. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one more and the final presentation of this year's IBC in, in 15 minutes. So we'll see you then. Thank you.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the note editor, even better redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, cloth, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh. Or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new note editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, new nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. All through this year, we've been regularly releasing new sets of capsules. Maxon's collection of tailor-made materials, models, and nodal assets to help you kickstart your projects, including plant assets by Laubwerk, home decor models by Pavel Zoch, and registered materials by Fuchs and Vogel that are perfect for architectural visualization, product shots, and motion graphics. There's also a new brake spline modifier by Rocket Lasso, which allows you to evenly or randomly subdivide splines with spacing, great for creating dynamic stacks with objects swept along curves. Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to easily use 3D tracking data to accurately place flares in a scene, or direct your flare with a parallel light or spotlight cone angle. You can also now control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. 
Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great for those classic 1970s and 80s movie looks. And in what is sure to be a favorite, schmutz can now be illuminated by the background, or your flare, or both. To help you work more efficiently in Real Lens Flares, we've also added a draft mode. Simply enable draft mode on your After Effects layer, and the render quality will be reduced by a factor of 4 to increase performance. When you go to render, draft mode is automatically ignored, and your flare is rendered at full quality. And remember that Real Lens Flares and many of these new features are also now available in Adobe Premiere Pro. Universe has hundreds of presets to help you get started, and this release adds over 50 new presets to inspire your creativity and give your designs and edits a head start. Magic Bullet Looks also adds dozens of new presets to give you even more options for professional creative color grades. Also, the OCIO configuration in your After Effects project is now seen and synchronized with Magic Bullet Looks, so you don't have to worry about getting consistent color throughout your pipeline. Trapcode Particular has hot new features, introducing Combustion, a new fluid dynamics option to create fiery looks with particular particles. Control attributes like temperature over life as particles ignite and then turn to smoke. If you've ever created particle trails from a parent and had to increase the particle account significantly in order to create a line, now with the new stroke from parent feature, those lines are created for you automatically. Create particle trails and tails fast and easy and at perfect quality while still having control over essential attributes such as size, color, and opacity over life.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the note editor, even better redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object, creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all-new Normal Editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normals Welcome back, and it's the last presentation of IBC 2023. We have Chad Perkins, who is Maxon trainer, and he's going to present about hidden gems of Trap Court particular. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks for being here, everybody. In the last uh, session, the last day, or the last few remaining survivors, which is pretty exciting. Um, as Karan mentioned, I'm a trainer for Maxon. Like, that's my official job duty. And so one of the things that we do is that like if somebody buys a bunch, like if we have a customer that like buys a bunch of licenses or whatever, we just, we give them like free training like crazy. So that's like one of the things that I do is like I, you'll know, have like these Zoom meetings or whatever with, you know, customers and uh, teach them how to use our stuff. So uh, one of the things I teach about is uh, particular. And uh, a lot of times when I'm teaching particular, there'll be somebody in the group that I'm teaching who's just like, I've been using particular forever. I'm super advanced. I know everything. And 100% of the time, when somebody says that, their artwork is amazing, and it's better than, everything that they make is better than anything I will ever make. But also, almost 100% of the time, there is a bunch of stuff that they don't know. There's a bunch of things that they like, oh, I wasn't aware that that existed. And so in my years of teaching clients, I've decided to make like a little like composite of uh, these little like hidden gems that a lot of people don't seem to be aware of, the things that you can do in particular. And sometimes they're, you know, they're new features and so people aren't aware that, aware that they exist or maybe like it's, uh, they don't understand what it's doing or where it is or uh, whatever. But these are the 10 hidden gems 
of uh, trap code particular. So the first hidden gem is emit from parent end of life. Emit from pa parent end of life. So let's talk about what that is about. By show of hands, uh, if anybody's brave enough to raise their hand here, this is the last, this is the last session. Nobody's here. Um, does anybody know what this is off the top of their heads? Anybody like show of hands? I mean, it's like, I know what, Amer yeah, the head of training knows what this is uh, for Maxon. But uh, okay, no other hands. Okay. So let's talk about what, what this is about. This is a fun one that uh, sounds really morbid and dark, uh, but it's actually very, very useful. So we're going to start with a very ugly example. So don't just get up and walk away because this looks terrible. This is intentionally, looks really bad, so it's very clear what's going on. So I have here these, again, uh, little particles that are just like shooting off. Now, for a long time in particular, we've been able to add uh, auxiliary particles. And that creates, that makes it so that one particle can emit other particles. Now, we changed that a few years ago so instead of having auxiliary particles, we have multiple systems. So that's in this like the show systems area, all these different systems. And we can reference a parent system. So we can have like child particle systems that emit from a parent emitter. So uh, if I go to my second system, which I've already set up here, open this up. And I can change this from emitter type from point, where it's just kind of like emitting from a point in the center. I could change this to emit from parent. So now each one of these parent particles, each one of these uh, ugly pink stars becomes an emitter. And that's really important. So that's, a, that's the first step is that uh, that's the new auxiliary particles is emit from parent. But when we go to the uh, emitter from parent behavior, we have all of these very interesting options. Uh, and some of these we'll be looking at like as we go throughout my little uh, presentation here. But one of them is emit at parent end of life. So if I choose this option now, I don't have a very long lifespan on these uh, pink stars. <clears throat> but you see there's no white particles. But as soon as a pink particle dies, then we have the new system emitting at the parent end of life. That's very intriguing. What can you do with that? I'm glad no one asked. I'm glad you asked. You're thinking it in your head. So uh, one of the things that I did, um, which is really awesome, I, I love the, the 1950s. I love that kind of like atomic age, mid-century modern, like uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle, like art style. It's like dopey and fun and like homemade. And I don't know, it just reminds me of being a, a child. And so I convinced Maxon to let me add some assets to the asset browser. And so I, I made these two different uh, assets. I made uh, a series of bubbles. So it's just like a distorted circle every frame. And make, that makes bubbles. And then I made this second uh, sprite, which is like, uh, this is like an illustrator, super low uh, budget here, but just got like these little lines that kind of like go out like that. So it's just like a little pop, you know, just like a little pop. So I wanted to make some fun carbonation. So what I did is I had on one system, I have my, my bubbles. And they don't last very long. So my little bubbles go up, my little 1950s fun bubbles. Isn't that fun? I think it's fun. I think it's so cute. Look at it. Ooh, bubbles. Uh, and then I have my second system emit from the parent end of life. So then when the bubble pops or dies, then my little like, woo, 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 little like, um, my little animation, my little pop happens. And then we put it together. It's a little pop, 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 pop. Little fun, happy, fun, little pop thing, because we're using this feature, the emit from parent end of life. So the little pop is triggered when the parent particle dies. And this is a new preset we just added to the asset, or the, um, not the asset browser, the uh, designer uh, in particular, so you can use this uh, whenever you'd like. Uh, there's another uh, preference or another uh, preset that I created that was just um, released, which, which is a bullet hit. So we have one system that's going into a wall, and actually it's a bounce system, which we're going to talk about in a second, a little spoiler for, for uh, hidden gem number two. Uh, but it's hitting a wall and exploding, and then it's uh, have the little sparks that uh, they hit. So these little sparks are emitted at the end of the parent life again. And then I did this other final one, uh, good for splashes, so a little fire hydrant, and there's some like cartoony water that comes out, and then there's like some cartoony... Uh, splashes. So all kinds of things where you need kind of like an impact or something that reacts, uh, emit from parent end of life. 
great hidden gem. Okay, let's move on to hidden gem. Number, nope, I hit the wrong shortcut key. I was very anticlimactic. Uh, number two is built-in ground plane. So for a long time, particles have been able to bounce. Um, but the bouncing, the way that they bounce has been, how do I put this delicate? It's been annoying. It's been really, really annoying and frustrating to work with a lot of times because that's to use the 3D and After Effects and blah, blah, blah. It's kind of a mess. But now there's a built-in ground plane in, uh, in particular. So if I have particles, I just have to have these particles set up. It's just dumb particles. They're just like falling down to the ground, right? I can go into physics simulations, enable bounce. And normally this would take an external layer to do this, but I can choose enable ground plane. And now there's this ground plane area. I'll open up ground plane and I could see it by choosing show overlay so I could see where it is. So now I don't need to get another layer and position it in like 3D space, wherever that is and then try to like guess of where it's gonna land. I could just use this ground plane, and look at that, beautiful little bounce. And I could adjust the height of this, I could have it go, uh, oops, probably not 103%. But I could have it go uh, higher, lower, I can tilt it, roll it, uh, that kind of thing to create all kinds of interesting effects. Now, one of the great things about bounce, if you've never used bounce, is that uh, there is this collision event. So not only do you get to say like, hey, look, I could bounce particles, which is fun, you could also specify what happens at the bounce. Now, the default is just like the standard bounce, and bounce. But there's also a slide. So we could hit the thing, and instead of bouncing, it's just like slide. And then we also have the particles like stick onto the things. Or, which is very interesting in light of hidden gem number one, we could have the particles kill. So we could have the particles touch the bounce, this new built in ground plane from hidden gem number two, and they touch the ground plane, and then we could kill them which can then trigger the emit from parent end of life that we just learned about in the hidden gem number one. So it all works together. Sharing a Coke for the benefit of mankind. Peace, I don't know. Okay, hidden gem number three. Doo -doo -doo. I need the Zelda music. You know, like in Zelda when you used a bomb on a cave and it's like, -doo 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 -doo. Uh, I wish I had that. I was actually thinking about it enough time. I ran out of time. Okay, stroke from parent. Stroke from Parent is the third hidden gem. Uh, and this was just released like a couple days ago. I don't know what day it is or where I am, but it was released just a few days ago. It's brand new, Stroke from Parent. And this is really great because <clears throat> there's a lot of times where you can kind of like hack particular to do certain things. Um, and in this case, um, I, I want to create these like streams of particles. So then you have to use a bunch of particles, bunch, 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 bunch of particles to create the illusion that there's like a straight line. Really just want a straight line though. But then if those straight lines bend too much, like we have here, then we stretch and we see that it's actually just a series of particles and that's kind of like annoying. So it kind of kills my design because I have to keep increasing the number of particles. Well, not anymore, my friends, thanks to hidden gem number three, I can go to stroke from parent. And so on my child system, Basically, this, the way this is made, if you're new to particular, is I have these just random particles just kind of like shooting out with my parent system. And then I have a second system that says emit from parent. And the second system doesn't have any of its own velocity. It's just kind of like, I'll go where you want me to go. And then um, there's a bunch of them, so it creates these trails. But again, we have that, that issue before. But now this new feature um, in the emitter type, instead of emitting from parent, we can choose to create a stroke from parent. So I'm gonna zoom in so you can see this a little bit more clearly. See all that uh, garbage and that nonsense going on? Nobody has time for. I changed this to stroke from parent. Boom, look at that. Clean lines, smooth, beautiful, clean, stroke from parent lines. And now we have these great electrical magic things here. Now, this uh, project also is spoiling hidden gem number four, because hidden gem number four, uh, this is using a bunch of stuff from hidden gem number four. So let's talk about that. We're going to come back here in a second. So hidden gem number four, feel free to play the Zelda music in your head. Hidden gem number four is child inheritance. Now I have to admit that this was uh, an interesting thing. When the uh, product manager of Trapcode told me that they're coming out with this feature, I was like, 
bro, I think, in your, I think you're missing the mark on that one. That's, we already have like the ability to inherit stuff from parent systems. It's no big deal. But then he schooled me, and it's actually an epic, incredible feature for using multiple systems together in intelligent ways. So this is um, before child inheritance. So like earlier this year, this is the best you could do um, with uh, particular with creating that kind of like look I was going for before because what would happen is if I open up the designer, I have my uh, design and what you could do before. So I have my parent system that's using like this color and it has like, it's hard to see. This is not a good trainer thing of me to do because I, I knew this projector was like this that it would be impossible to see. But uh, I have these like little circles here. Maybe I can increase the size so you can see them. See those? See those little circles? Uh, so I have these little circles, and those are the parent particles. And then I have the, uh, the, the stroke from parent that are the, the children particles. Now what I could do is I can delete the size rotation block in the designer so that the child uses the size rotation of the parent, and it uses the opacity or whatever. But here's where that is a problem. If I have, for example, random size, so if I click on the size rotation block of the parent system, I have a size random of 100%. So those little like colored circles are all random sizes. Also, I have opacity random at 100%. They're all random opacities. So when I delete the child opacity block, it's using 100% opacity too. It's using that from the parent, but it's not the same opacity. Does that make sense? So if like there's a parent particle that it's 37% opacity, the child particle is not 37% opacity, it's just some other random number. But with child inheritance, it does have the 37% opacity. It matches the parent, so you can create a much more interesting and beautiful effects. So that's what we have here. Inherit opacity from parent. So when we uh, check this, and actually I'll just go ahead and cancel in the designer. You can see it a little bit more clearly because it's laid out here. I can inherit the particle type from the parent system. I can inherit the size from parent. I can inherit the opacity from parent. And also, there's a color from parent uh, slider here. I can increase this to 100%. So now, instead of just like using the same gradient and getting whatever random colors, it can actually use the exact uh, color of the, that exact parent particle and the exact opacity of that parent particle, the exact size of that parent particle. And that allows us to have something unique like this where the head particle is the same opacity as the tail particle. It's the same color, the same size, same everything else. Uh, for more advanced users, you might say, well, what if I still want a little bit of control over my child particles, that's where you could still come in and use the size over life graphs. So I can come over here to my presets, use a linear slope, and then this is still trailing so that the start of the particle is still using the size from the parent, and then we have control over the rest of the tail by using these uh, graphs, which is pretty fun. Okay, moving right along. Okay, this is a, this is a fun one. This is a fun one. This is like a... This is probably the highlight of the presentation right here. This is probably the best stuff. So the number five is the power of custom sprites. So we know that particle systems are just a series of like particles. We call them sprites. And then they're shooting off, doing business. They're doing their own thing. Um, and they could be little spheres. They could be whatever we want. And there's a bunch of built-in ones. There's like all these different shapes. There's stars and things like that. And there's a tendency to feel like you know, and also there's a good, this great library I should point out too. Like there's, you know, if I go to, oh, let me, uh, okay, particle type, I could choose sprite and then I click choose sprite and there's a big library of a bunch of shapes that we could choose from. They're just built into particular. And there's a tendency, I think, but even between like more advanced intermediate uh, particular users to be like, this is just all there is. This is just kind of like the choices that you have in sprites is like the ones that are built in. No, this is just an extra library. You can actually use almost anything as a custom sprite and you could get in all kinds of wonderful, wonderful trouble by playing around with what you can use as sprites. So I mentioned my little like, uh, you know, carbonation thing, my little uh, carbonation uh, animation. What's really interesting about this, though, that maybe is not super obvious, is that my bubbles composition that I'm using, these are both actually movie files. So you can use 
any images in your composition as sprites, as particles. You could use movie files. You can use comps. You could use anything, Illustrator files, anything you bring into uh, After Effects, basically, you can use as a particle in particular. And not only that, I should have split this into two. I could have really milked it and saved myself some more if I would have split this into two tricks. But a big part of that, too, is not only uh, the fact that you can have anything be a particle, but it's the way that you can use those particles. So I mentioned like my little bubbles here, right? And I just basically, like the way that I, I made this little movie is I made a circle shape layer and then distorted it with like turbulent displace. Um, but then, you know, the, the movie itself is like garbage. And I don't really actually want these bubbles to do this. I just wanted a bunch of variations. But then when I set this up as a custom particle, in particular, and we can go there really quick. Go to the bubbles. Let me go to my, my particle section. Go to my sprites. I have all these sprite controls. In these sprite controls, I have this time sampling. And this is where the power of this tip really comes in handy, is in this thing. The way that we can control how particular samples, the video animation thing, is, gives us so much flexibility. So I have it set to random still frame. So basically what that does is it looks at my like, wobbly bubbles, and it doesn't use any of the animation at all. It just takes a random frame from anywhere in that movie, and then every particle is just one of those random frames. So then I have all this variation in my bubbles without doing anything else. But wait, there's more. Um, I have an autosave. Oh, killed my thunder so much. Killed my thunder so much. Anyway, OK. So I have this um, pre-comp using HUD components. And uh, not to bore you with the technical specs, but this actually is, this is relevant. But it's a six seconds long pre-comp that I'm using as the particle. And there's three different animations, all from HUD components in Universe. So three different animations in the same pre-comp. Because if I wanted to use, like I have this like, array of particles, right? And let's say that I wanted each one to be a different animating particle. That's a pretty tough challenge. For those of you that are familiar with particular, think about that for a second. If you had to have like a grid of particles in form and each one had to be a different movie file playing back, a different animation, like how would you set that up? Like you might have to do like multiple systems and then it, it, it would be a, a logistical nightmare if you don't know about this feature called split clip. So I have this set up by the default settings, but, uh, and this renders really slow because it's like a, there's like a lot going on. There's the HUD components, like animation in the background. But if I keep playing this for a second, let's see here. I'm just going to skip ahead because this, this is the default settings. So you notice that some of these change over. I'm trying to find one that changes over. OK, here we go. So um, this green one, second from the left, second from the bottom, you know, it plays uh, a, a random spot, and then it changes over to the red one. Well, I don't want that. I want each particle to stay with the blue, stay with the green, stay with the red. So how can I do that? What I can do is I can go into my sprite settings, and the time sampling, there's this amazing thing called split clip. And the brilliance of this is that it looks inside the file, and it allows you to use chunks of a video file or chunks of a pre-comp and split it up evenly and use separate portions of that as a video particle. So I'll say split clip loop. And once I do that, um, then what it's going to do, oh, that shouldn't happen. Oh, yeah, once you do that, then you have to specify the, boy, this like, thing is impossible to see, the number of clips. I have to specify the number of clips, and then it will divide the comp or the video into equal portions. And I didn't do that yet. So I need to say this is three equal portions here. That should change things. And now the particles just stay. The red particles are just like, well, there's some weird frames in there from, uh, no. Yeah, like right here, there's a little glitch. I'd have to clear out my cache, my memory cache. But the thing is that these things um, loop and they just use that one little section, and they just loop the same frames. So you're able to have multiple video particles that just loop in this, using the same system, which is uh, very powerful. Um, let's see. Oh, here's another uh, use of, how are we doing on time? We're doing OK on time. 
This project takes a second to load because this is like really beefy. We'll look at a rendered version of this in a bit, but I decided um, that uh, my life is too enjoyable and I'd like to torture myself. So I decided to recreate uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night entirely in tra uh, trap code particular. I call it particularly Starry Night um, because uh, I'm not original and I just, <laughs> just thought of the first thing that came to mind. But the process of doing that was one of my favorite learning experiences using Particular. I learned so much about um, little nuances. And this is one of the things that kind of really stuck out to me. Uh, again, I'll play you the rendered version in just, a, in just a bit. But I wanted to show you one aspect of the working project, which is obviously, you know, it's colossal. Also, I set this up to be too big. I don't remember what the size was, but it's, it's colossal and it's, it was dumb. But if you look at this, there's a, these animated paint strokes um, actually, you know what, I, I'm going to have to show you the rendered version or else this isn't going to make any sense. Okay, so let me play the rendered version here. Okay, so that's, that's the... Uh, the final rendered version of like Starry Night there. But if you look at like, you know, some of these like paint things, it feels like little like, uh, you know, like pieces of, uh, pieces of paint here. And a lot of this is, um, or like a, these like paint strokes created in like the easiest possible way, which is really interesting. So I, let's go to my paint from capsule. So if I look at this, these are my paint strokes. These are so low budget, it's uh, ridiculous. If I take off the effects, I'm just using the capsule. I actually stole this from the particular sprite library, just a plain, plain capsule. And then I uh, added these effects on it. I added like uh, rough and edges, and then I put turbulent displace on them, and then turbulent noise, which looks terrible. And then I tend to just change it a little bit. So then all of these different particles are just random shapes. And so I use the power of the sprite stuff I was telling you about, the, the time sampling thing, to be able to tell, you know, each paint stroke should be using a different one of these like janky things. And then I just like recolored it and I was able to come up with something that like doesn't feel that janky to me. So there's that, that's fun. Okay, moving on to hidden gem number six, which is, oops. <laughs> <laughs> Killed my own thunder on that one and maximized the time limit. Okay, one more time. It is number six. Two kinds of wind, two kinds of turbulence. Two kinds of wind, two kinds of turbulence. This one is, uh, this is just as dumb as it sounds, actually. I'm going to be honest with you. This is not, uh, this one's not that thrilling. It's kind of like a more of a technical thing. This is kind of like the weak part of the, this is the weak one of the bunch. But it's still helpful to know about, I think. So um, inside of particular, there's always been like turbulence for the longest time. You could add turbulence to particles and make them kind of like move around in an organic way. And there's also been like wind for a long time. And then what a lot of people don't know is that a couple years ago, we changed that and we added a new system, but also kept the old system. So now there's two different ways to displace particles and two different ways to add wind to particles. And people are confused um, oftentimes about them. And so I want to lay it down here. So... This, uh, in the displace category, actually, let me go to particular so we could like, look at this. In the displace category, there is this um, turbulent field area. Turbulence field. You see in that there? Turbulence field. So this is this, the old system that's been there. And if I play this, this is what that happens. It's, it's great for like particles moving over a surface, getting displaced, riding waves, uh, that kind of thing. But... You know, if you're thinking about the way that uh, life works most of the time, you know, like in air, when a particle like hits something that causes it to move a different direction and change its physics, like it doesn't go back to where it started. It just keeps going in that trajectory. It doesn't like return. But if you look at this uh, displaced turbulent field, things, particles get bumped and then they come back down. They get bumped and they come back down. And that's, that's not realistic. So then we also have this environment air turbulence, which is a more advanced simulation. Um, and it takes a little bit longer to render, not, not much, but a little bit longer to render because it's actually doing a real simulation of what it would feel like to hit air turbulence. So you can really see the difference here. If I play this. 
So the top one, again, is the old displace turbulent field, where it's just kind of like going up and down. And the second one is much more realistic. It's, it's going to start uh, messing up my design here and <laughs> encroaching upon uh, the other thing. Because as those particles, again, in a very realistic and organic way, they hit the air turbulence, they keep going in that direction. So uh, much more realistic. Let's see the difference there. Very interesting. So be aware of that. Um, and then also there's two different kinds of uh, wind. So in this example, I'm using something called meander, which is um, uh, an effect for a, a, a physics simulation effect, which causes each particle to kind of have their own like state of mind. So it kind of looks like an aerial view of like people just being like confused and like wandering around. Um, and so there's two different kinds of wind. So the, the original wind is now in the displaced section. Oops. Come on. There we go. So the original uh, wind is in the displaced system as well. So all the old stuff is in the, uh, the uh, displaced area. And so this is drift, which is what used to be called wind, is now called drift. And it's a little bit less intelligent. So this is what we've always had. It works with physics simulations. Just kind of moves it along, just get, etches it along there. That's fine. But the new system, which is actually called wind, and it's the new wind, is a little bit more intelligent. It's going to look at the particles, and you could just tell by the way the particles move that it's a much more organic, uh, intelligent system of moving. So again, the top is the old system in the dis drift and displaced category, and the bottom one is uh, in the environment section where all the new fancy stu physics stuff is, is wind. And notice how the stuff on the bottom, like, you could see the turbulence in the air that it's not moving all particles uniformly in the same way. The top stuff feels a little bit like uh, less organic. It's just like kind of scooting. It's almost like you animated the position property of it or something like that. You're just kind of scoot it along. Whereas the bottom one feels like it's being influenced by a force. And indeed, it is. So, okay, moving on from that tip. Hinge jab number seven. Okay, I'm going to maximize this. Hidden gem number seven. It is form in particular equals love. Uh, anybody use trap code form? Anybody use trap code form? Yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Form is like my favorite, favorite thing. I love form so much. Um, and uh, people have wondered like why we don't talk about trap code form that much. And it's because we actually put trap code form inside of particular. So a lot of people who are fans of track code form are not aware that we put form into form behavior into particular. And basically what track code form is, if you're not um, familiar with it, is that you know most particle systems, including particular, have this uh, way of doing things where you know you have, you have an emitter that shoots out particles and the particles have a lifespan and then they live and then they die out. That's just kind of like particle system 101. It's just what they do. But form doesn't have a birth or a death. The particles are just there, like immortal gods. They just exist. And then you could do all kinds of wacky stuff to them because they're just there. I think it, like for motion designers, for VFX, for all kinds of things, like form is so versatile. It's just like one of the most like underused, amazing tools. And they have it now built in. The way you use this is I go into the emitter section and I need to choose either box or sphere. And so I could choose box. And then I need to change the behavior because even if you say box, it's like still like emitting from a box. But now I need to change the behavior, the emitter behavior from just continuously emitting to either classic or dynamic form. The difference between these two, by the way, is that uh, dynamic form is used for physics simulations. But if you're not using physics simulations, then you want to make sure and choose classic form in all other cases. So I choose classic form. And now as I play this back, you'll see no difference. The particles just exist. And I can go to distribution. I could put these on a grid. And there I have a grid of particles. I could specify how many particles I want in X, Y, or Z. I could specify the size with the emitter size. Now I just have this box of particles. And I could do all these kind of beautiful formy things. Like I could go to my particle settings, change the color to something uh, more pleasing to the eye here. And then I can go into uh, displace, uh, turbulence field, affect uh, the displacement of these particles and start creating some like really interesting results here. And maybe I could go even go to uh, a blend mode, add the add blend mode. So when these particles overlap, they get brighter and uh, 
you know, we can do all kinds of interesting things uh, with these particles. Now, um, I can also go to the designer. This is another thing that people don't, uh, aren't aware of. For those of us that are fans of particular, maybe I could just reset this. Yeah, okay, start from scratch. What I can do is I can go to the emitter type, and instead of going and choosing all those settings one by one and being like, oh, I gotta change this to this and change this to this, I can just go into my blocks here. You just put your mouse over that blocks in the upper right-hand corner, and there's all these blocks right there. C form box right there, classic form box. That's what the C stands for. And there's a dynamic form box or a classic form box or a classic form sphere or whatever, and I could just choose classic form box, and I already have form just ready to go from a, a block just ready to go there. Now. Um, just to show you, this is an example that I, when, when we first announced this feature, I uh, played with this. I was like, what can you do? So I did this with just one, one instance of particular. This was on like 16 different systems. But this is what happens when you use particular and form together. It's just like all kinds of different things, aspects of this, or some are form, some are particular. But it's all just one layer, one instance of particular on one layer, but all these layers like working together. And look at how like the smoke from particular is uh, going around the, you know, straight of the star in form. Uh, there's like all kinds of fun things you can uh, do with that as you have this world. And then like, you know, there's like a ground plane uh, of particles and a wall of particles all built in form. Uh, but then we have like sparkles in particular. And, you know, you could emit from parent particles from form in particular. There's just all kinds of things you can do when using these incredible tools together, which they are now like built in, which is fantastic. Okay. Here we go. Got a couple more here. This is uh, number eight, I think. What is this? Number eight. Yes. Using layer maps. Layer maps. People who are familiar with form uh, know about layer maps, but they've been recently added to particular. So a lot of people who are, uh, have a background in particular maybe don't know what layer maps are. So that's my hidden gem is using layer maps. Now, what layer maps allow us to do is to use another layer as a map for our particles for all kinds of stuff. So to show you what I have going on here first, I have this texture. It's just like this uh, nebula texture. And I want you to notice too that there are dark parts in this uh, part of the image and bright spots in this part of the image. And that's important because some of the uh, ways you can map layer stuff onto particles will use that luminance. So I have here, um, Actually, if I zoom in close, you can kind of see this is actually a very dense grid of particles. Very dense grid of form, form particles. But what I can do is go into layer maps, and these are all the different ways that I can map another layer to control my particles. So if you had, let's say, a corporate logo or something, you could use it to control the rotation of particles or use it to, use it to control the size of particles or the displacement or the turbulence strength or whatever. You could do all kinds of really fun and interesting things by using other layers to control your particles. So I'll just start off really simple here. I'll go to color and alpha, and I need to specify that I want to use this uh, layer as my uh, color. It's always a good idea to uh, use effects and masks if you're using effects and masks. And oftentimes it doesn't work because you need to specify the map over value. So you can't just say like, hey, use this layer. You have to say, use this layer in this way. So by default, map over is off, but I can map this layer over X and Y. I can map it over X and Z, or I can map it over time. I could do all the kinds of interesting things in that way, but I'll just Keep it simple, map it over um, X and Y. Now, uh, it doesn't seem like anything happened, but what it's done is it's mapped all of the color data from that nebula onto my particles. So now my particles can be displaced, they can move, and it's going to have the color of that image. So there's all kinds of fun things we could do with that. So let's say I want to displace this. So I'll say I want RGB to XYZ, and again, we have to do, uh, we have to set the map up, pre-comp space texture, and then we have to choose how we're going to map this. Let's map it over X and Y. So now we've displaced our particles. I can control the strength here, which is pretty exciting. So again, it's using the lum luminance. So it's pushing back the black particles and pulling forward the uh, brighter particles and uh, using that to displace this. So I could go into my rotation here so we could kind of see this a little bit more. 
and we're creating, oh, maybe it went the other way. I always get confused with like white and black, which, which way, which direction, which thing goes. So it's actually pushing back the white particles and pulling forward the black particles. I don't know, whatever. I always get confused. So anyways, we can see that we're actually almost creating 3D geometry out of particles by using a layer map and displacing uh, the stuff this way. So I could go to my displacement. Maybe I even increase the... Don't be an alarm right now. That's not a great time for an alarm. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so I can increase strength, and then you can see that I'm actually displacing the particles and, uh, again, creating almost like a 3D geometry with this. So layer maps are a very powerful way of uh, creating great imagery. And again, back to uh, the particularly starry night. Uh, when I first um, applied this, you know, I got all of this... Um, this beautiful randomness, kind of like similar to what Van Gogh had, where like they're just, you know, here's like a little piece of white for some reason. There's like a yellowish little piece of paint in there. And I wanted to be able to capture all of that in my paint strokes. So I used layer maps. I just brought this in as like a simple like image. And that's how I was able to create the layer map in the background. Then I could displace it and move those particles around with other tools. But they already had Van Gogh's color palette and his uh, paint choices because of layer maps. Okay, we are now at number nine. Number nine of the hidden gems. Number nine is making magic in 3D. Making magic in 3D. So basically this is letting you know that we can use 3D objects in particular in two ways. And uh, pause for a dramatic effect while I drink water. But we can use 3D objects in two different ways in particular. We can use it in a form way, and we can use it in a particular way. So when we use it with particular, a 3D object becomes an emitter. So we can emit things from a 3D object. And sometimes that's more challenging because, you know, if you have a face and it's emitting particles, or a head that's emitting particles, it's going to look similar to if you had a sphere emitting particles. So... It's not going to be until the, the final tip that that becomes cool. So we'll save that for a, a second. But when you have form particles, what it does is it arranges those particles in the shape of a 3D object. So I'll go into emitter, and uh, I'll change this to box, change this to uh, classic form. We have a box of particles here. But what I want to do is actually not do uh, a box. I want to change this to 3D model. I want to emit from a 3D model. Now, it goes black initially because it's like, okay, well, what 3D model do you want to emit from? And you haven't chosen one yet. So that's why, don't panic. That's, it's normal. And so I can click on choose model. And there's a load of 3D models that ship with particular. So I have a huge collection here. I mentioned the, uh, the bust of a male. So let's say male bust here. So now... Um, I don't have enough uh, particles. I need more particles. So what I could do is increase my particles. And then now we have a face, a head, a bust, being made out of particles, which is pretty cool. And because it's being arranged in 3D, I can, you know, move this around like so. And again, because it's... Uh, Particular, works with lights, I can uh, light this up. Well, it's not showing first. I need to go to my uh, light settings here. So I can go into lighting and enable lighting. And then, okay, now it's too dark. Okay, I'm going to bump up the intensity here. There we go. So you see we have, uh, again, 3D particles that we can light and work with in a really cool way. And of course, we have all the benefits of uh, trap code form in this case. I'm just going to up the particle count so we have a little bit more coverage here. But I can go into my displace section. I could go into turbulence field, and I could increase the uh, displacement, create some interesting effects there. I could have that same thing affect the size. Ooh, that's really gross. Apologies. Uh, I could have it affect the opacity. There we go. And so now, like, it's already starting to have a little bit of life. You know, we could add more particles if we want to, but now we have a 3D head that we could move a camera around, we could move lights around, we could set up, like, um, other lights and uh, light this in a normal way. But 
um, all because of the power of, uh, of form and 3D objects, which is pretty cool. I uh, really love that ability. Okay, um, so I mentioned how it's more challenging using them with particular without the final tip. So let's get to the final tip, which is da -da 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 -da. try to make it seem more grandiose than it is. Is velocity over life, velocity over life. So in the same way that we can control most properties in uh, or many properties in particular with a graph, there's you know the size over life, opacity over life, and we could use this really great newly redesigned graph to control these different attributes. Velocity over life is one that doesn't get enough love. So if I go to um, the same spot, emitter, I'm gonna choose 3D model, and uh, let's just go ahead and choose the same 3D model. I'll just I'll bust female, kind of spread the wealth here. And if I choose uh, this now, it's, it's by default, it's doing this um, particular behavior. So again, we can't really tell that we have a 3D head here. But if I wanted to have the particles here on the head and then have some particles kind of like flying off, particular would be the best choice or over form. So I could get the best of both worlds here by going into velocity over life. So what I could do is have the velocity be nothing in the beginning and nothing for a while. There we go, there we go. And maybe crank up the particles per second. So there's more particles here. And then what happens is over life, then they start to drift. See that? So then we get the best of both worlds. We have some particles that when they're born, the first half of their life, they just like hang out. They're like, that's cool, I'm chilling. And then they start getting a little antsy. They start having a midlife crisis, start buying a motorcycle and wanting to go uh, travel the world. And then they want to go off and do things, right? So the power and the control of using form in particular together, using velocity over life. And there you have it. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think that's, um, that's about my, my time. Thank you so much. It means a lot that you would sit here at the very end when the energy, everybody's like packing up and going away and stuff like that. So thank you so much for uh, being here. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chad. Um, it's always amazing with what you create and how you create. He's a massive art lover. So any art recommendations you have globally, please send it to him. And he'll Please. be happy to be inspired and create something amazing. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all for your patience and your love and, and everybody watching online. Thank you so much for being with us for the past four days. Uh, this was the last presentation, and we'll see you next year uh, at IBC. We will be here. Uh, hopefully, I'll still have some hair on my head, so, and I'll be still here uh, hosting you all. Thank you. <laughs>